Ani nana shnabik ani chumik manak gimigwechu agu gamiji yung ulu gijigat. Welcome everyone to another session of Unsettling Genealogies. My name is Gordon Henry and uh, sort of the organizer for this conference. It's the Leslie Endowed Chair uh, in American Indian Literature in the English Department here at Michigan State University. I'm honored tonight to introduce Dr. Jabbar Bennett. Uh, I'm just gonna give a welcome to you all. I appreciate you all being here and Dr. Bennett being here. Dr. Bennett, as you know, is a Vice President and Chief, Diversity, uh, Chief Officer for Diversity and Inclusion here at Michigan State University. I thank you, Dr. Bennett, for joining us and uh, hope you can offer some words of welcome tonight to, uh, to our panelists and attendees. Dr. Bennett, please. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, uh, Dr. Henry. So as you heard, my name is Jabbar Bennett, and I serve as Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at Michigan State University. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Gordon Henry, uh, enrolled member of the White Earth Anishinaabe Nation of Minnesota, and Audrey and John Leslie and Dow Chair in American Indian and Indigenous Literary Studies here at MSU for inviting me to join you. Uh, I truly applaud Professor Henry, uh, along with today's presenters and all of you, for engaging in this critical conversation about American Indian literature, arts, and social justice, which shape our understanding, influence our outcomes, and impact the lives of American Indian people in both beneficial and sometimes adverse ways. I understand the importance of protecting and communicating your own narrative to ensure the acknowledgement of atrocities, both past and present, and to chart a clear and honest path forward toward greater recognition, healing, and more broadly justice on behalf of Native and Indigenous people and communities. I joined MSU back in 2020 as the first Vice President Chief Diversity Officer charged with advancing institution-wide strategic priorities related to diversity, equity, inclusion. And my team and I in the Office for Institutional Diversity and Inclusion partner with colleagues every day to increase diversity, ensure equity, promote inclusion, and enhance outreach and engagement. And these key areas of focus are relevant to members of our campus community, as well as our local neighbors and those across the state, including our tribal partners. So as you know, and this may not be new to you, but I want to say it. Uh, MSU was designated as the nation's pioneer land grant institution. And I understand how problematic that is. And as part of our recently completed university strategic planning process, we interrogated our land grant identity and developed recommendations around how to frame and articulate this history with our mission and contemporary institutional priorities. So we're considering several things about what that pioneering land grant name means in the process of adopting an official land acknowledgement, increasing awareness around our history and legacy as a land grant institution, enriching MSU with a stronger presence uh, of indigenous faculty, students, and trainees, and enhancing collaboration with Native American indigenous communities across the state. I'll just say that these actions alone will not right all the wrongs, of our institutional national histories, but they will help us move forward together more honestly and sincerely too. And with that, again, thank you for allowing me to join you this evening and best wishes for a most candid, provocative and robust, robust discussion and conference too. So thanks, Dr. Henry. Well, thank you, Dr. Bennett. Again, thanks for joining us and for that, uh, those wonderful remarks. Um, we, we are really fortunate tonight again to have two really excellent speakers. I'm looking forward to hearing both of them. Um, our first speaker for tonight is uh, Cedar Sherbert. He's from the, the Pay Nation of Santa Isabel, community of Kumeya Nation of San Diego and Baja California. He is a writer, teacher, and features programmer for Tribeca and AFI Fest, and has numerous screen, screen uh, numerous works screened at Sundance, MoMA, and a number of other uh, film venues. Uh, please welcome Cedar. Uh, I think you'll you'll enjoy his story uh, if enjoys the right word. We're really honored to have him with us tonight. Cedar, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. It's it's a real honor to be here, and, and thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, so <clears throat> I have a story to tell. Um, you know, we talk about these things in in large sort of in policy discourse, but these these stories of pretendians are also how they affect us from tribal communities. So 
if you'll give me a few minutes, I'll let me let me go ahead and share it with you. Um, it started in 2004, in January 2004. And I was just back from Sundance where I was lucky enough to have my MFA thesis film screen as that as part of that festival's native forum. So I'm checking my answering machine and there's a message from a very familiar voice saying, I want to get you involved in a Native American project I'm working on. It was my former directing teacher from a university in Southern California. Um, this guy sort of had a or has a um, new agey bent. He's prone to going to sweat lodges and smudging, you know, you, you know, you know, those kind those kind of people. Um, and he he was he was a teacher at the university. And, you know, again, I had just graduated. The wind is in my sails. And he says he wants to bring me aboard a, a project, a Native American project to um, to clean up a script that he is slated to direct. Right. So, again, this is the veteran director of, of TV and, and, and film and with a long career. He's a friend. He's bringing me aboard a project that had a better chance of seeing the light of day than anything else I had been, you know, involved with up to that point. So I'm back from Sundance, blah, blah, blah. So to say no simply was not an option. So um, he gets me, he gets me in touch with the project's production company. And they very, very quickly send me the script in the mail. And again, 2004 hard copies. Um, so I, 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 I opened the script. And the story is the, the title is very familiar. It's called The Blood Runs Like a River Through My Dreams by Nazdij. And I'm thinking, this sounds really familiar. I, what? I know I've heard this before, and then it and then it hits me. I don't know. Back in two thousand or so, I met a I met a I'm getting a haircut down in Pacific Beach in San Diego, and I pick up an Esquire magazine with Mike Tyson on the cover, and I open it, and there's this very very potent story of a Navajo man and his son. Now it's not every day that you just pick up a magazine and you see an article by an Indian person. I mean, it was it was really powerful. And this to the story that was told was really potent. It was a half white, half Navajo man who adopts a native infant named Tommy Nothing Fancy. Um, and Tommy quickly shows signs of, of having FAS. He's prone to seizures and intense misbehavior. Um, but Tommy and his dad, Nazdish, find solace going fishing. Um, the solitude, you know, kind of quells the demons that, that, gripped, that gripped the boy. Um, and it isn't until Tommy's, I don't know, fifth or sixth year while he and his dad are on a routine fishing expedition that, that Tommy suffers his, his final seizure um, and right in his father's arms and their beloved dog Navajo, yeah, they named their dog Navajo, um, is kind of walking around and confused and, and, and Tommy becomes a spirit and Nazdij begins a life of just unremittent sadness and grief. You read this and it's this gut-wrenching essay. It's a really moving account of a father's love in the shadow of intergenerational trauma and you know the, the ripple effects of attempted extermination. Now, I had no idea. I had just read this. I took the magazine. I totally forgot about it. I had no idea that he had actually parlayed this, this um, article into like a career. I mean, he had written three memoirs. I had no idea. Um, the first of which contained was called the, um, the Blood Runs Like a River Through My Dreams, and it contained the titular essay, as well as a couple of others, two more, um, kind of detailing Nazdija's hard scrabble upbringing as the son of an alcoholic cowboy and this very indistinctly drawn Navajo mother. Um, but as a script, it was crap. I mean, it was it was junk. Um, it was unfilmable. Um, so in preparation for this, while um, I was getting my materials ready, I, I went through a box where I had all this stuff from, from this period. I found the script, I found the script. Um, I just opened it just to a random page. And um, if you'll indulge me just a, another minute, um, I want to read to you one scene. Exterior river, a light drizzle, good time for a bath. In the river, so, that is Nazdij's brother, TSO, so, in the river, so and Nazdij wash the pancake batter out of Tom's hair and body. Tom watches Nazdij and so shave. He feels his face for any hair. Nazdij swims over and pretends to shave him. Nazdij, now you are a man. Tom runs his fingers across some very large scars on Nazdij's chest and stomach. Tom, what are these? Nazdij, those are scars, Tom, where I got cut open by bull's horns. Tom, why? Nazdij, that's part of the job. Tom, what job? So, being an idiot. Nazdij, bull roping. 
I was pretty good before we had you. Made good money. So it's not the only way to earn money. Nazdij. I didn't always have much of a choice. So don't be so bullheaded. You always have plenty of choices. You always have. Nazdij picks up Tommy and throws him playfully into the air. Nazdij looks Tommy in the eye. I only have one choice. Oh, it gets better or worse, depending on your point of view. Um, so like Nazdij, I'm the product of a native mother and an Anglo dad, though I was raised solely by my mom within our community um, in San Diego, our Ipai and Tipai communities. Again, like, like Gordon said, I'm an enrolled member of the Ipai Nation of San Isabel. Um, and I spent the bulk of my youth kind of off and on reservations, kind of checkerboard, wherever the work was that you know mom could get. So it felt like it would be a good fit, right? But there were things that were just off from the very, very beginning. Like if he lived this life, if he grew up on the nation, he had this hard scrabble life, why do you need me? Like really, why do you need me? I'm not Navajo. Why, you know, and, and so, you know, I, I, I've been there a few times. I've had many Navajo friends and acquaintances and dates and this, and that, but I'm not Navajo. So I don't know the intricacies of the life of the culture. Um, and also why were the details of his life so murky in these books? Um, the other thing was that his books were just rife with suffering. And this is something Pretendians do. They just, they have these narratives of just, oh, suffering and abuse and oh, oh, oh. Anyway, so it was just almost, it was just too much. It was just, it was almost beyond human endurance. I mean, to the point of, it almost felt like a parody of abuse. So I meet with the production company and I say, look, I can do a better job from page one. So, so they pay me, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, dues is dues, but 800 bucks to write a feature length script to adapt this book. So I go off, I'm writing, I make an agreement with them. And um, after, after a month or two, I realize, you know what, if I'm gonna be interpreting this man's life, um, I wanna meet him. I wanna meet Nazdij. So um, the producer of the, <laughs> the, producer of the um, film, who is this very kind of mumbly indistinct presence, we'll call him Mumbles, uh, Mumbles and I fly to North Carolina outside of uh, Chapel Hill and we get in the car and we drive out to the forest or the woods or whatever and there is Nazdij, a very small, very nervous, soft-spoken white man without the slightest trace of native ancestry. Photos of him were always taken at a distance and with a hat. Um, so I spend two days there and I receive very little in the way of biographical information or insight other than permission. Um, once we get back to California, he says, he sends me an email and says, uh, and tells me, I give you my Tommy. So work continues, but now that I'm in Nazdij's orbit, you know, we're communicating via email, um, everything starts to slowly rot. Um, he has a number of online blog sites, blog addresses where he rails against everything and everyone. And he has a special sort of hatred for the publishing industry. After a short time, the effect of reading his daily screeds, just this daily barrage of hate, is just like it's like being locked in a small room with a, a screaming person. It's 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 just gross. And he also has a troubling preoccupation with taking care of young boys. This is something that is in all of his books. And these are published by Random House and you know, big publishers, but it's this thing that is always there. Okay. All three memoirs detail Nazdij taking care of sick and neglected young boys. Um, suffering from S FAS, AIDS, abuse. Okay, and so keep this in mind. So the relationship with um, the hippie director and Mumbles, the producer, was also deteriorating. Um, they kept pressuring me to get the, mo they wanted the script done. And so they kept pressuring me. I'm, I'm turning in pages, but evidently not fast enough. Um, they want their $800 worth all, as soon as they can get it. And I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing against instinct. Like I know, I know that something is wrong here. This whole scenario is just something's wrong. But, you know, again, he, he got me into the project. It's going to go somewhere. They're talking about having a big star, um, you know, as the lead. And but something is wrong at a gut level. The overall feeling was that I had been pulled into a crime of some kind of some kind. And it just weighed really heavily on me. It's moving forward meant that I had to tamp down any and all suspicions that I had. So it's now uh, mid-2004, and I'm asked to do a short film as part of a celebration of the life of James Welch, the, the Blackfeet writer that was to be held in Seattle that year. I make the film, I go to the event, and once there, 
I mentioned to some prominent native writers that, you know, I'm doing this Nas Dij, blah, blah, blah. And look at me like, oh, we know who he is. We don't know who he is, but we know about him. He steals. He steals from all of us. He's just, he's a con. They know that he's in North Carolina, but, you know, that's about it. They don't know his identity. And it was at that moment that that everything was out. Like I had, there was, there was nothing that I, the toothpaste was out of the tube, the genie was out of the bottle, whatever you want to, it was done. Like I couldn't, I couldn't continue. I couldn't continue. By this time the script was pretty much finished anyway, but it was like, well, what do I do? Um, and people that all, Indian writers had also been trying to out this guy for a long time. Um, and nobody in the publishing industry would listen. So, um, so I write an email to Mumbles the producer and I make sure to CC Nazdij and I call them out for ethnic fraud, though I don't have a smoking gun. I don't have a smoking gun. I was promptly rewarded with a cease and desist from Nazdij's lawyer. And I got a call from the hippies saying, like screaming, yelling, and, and saying, he ends it with, don't say anything about this to the Native American community. I'll never forget that moment. Don't say anything about this to the Native American community. This new ager who has all this respect for, for Indians and, and Native culture and everything and smudging and blah, blah, blah. Don't say anything about this to the Native American community is what he tells me. He doesn't stand up for me. So this was like a really harrowing, harrowing time. Um, I'm waiting to be sued. I was given a gag order by the person that I trusted, the, who I thought was on my side. You know, I was scared to death, man. I was scared to death. The only good thing was that that email that I sent scared Nazdij enough that he just sort of disappeared for a month or two, I remember, if I remember correctly. He just sort of disappeared. He went away. Um, but he comes back a month or two later, and this time he's taking care of a crew of sick and neglected young boys out of his house with a PayPal link at the bottom of the, um, of the, of the, uh, the site, the, the blog site. You know, and people are donating to him. So, and they all have, they're all sexually confused and they're all have desires for Nazdij, their hero, right? It's really gross. So I'm alone, I'm scared, I can't go to anybody. You know, there was no, it was, it was a different time. And I didn't know, I, talking to my friends about this, it was just so weird. Like life was just a hall of mirrors. It was surreal. Um, and all I could think of was, you know, I'm, I'm here in LA, I'm, I'm, a lot of people who came before me didn't have these opportunities, my grandpa, my grandma, a lot of Indian people who, you know, the community that I grew up in, in went through a lot so that I could be here. It's like, well, what do I do now? You know, what do I do now? He's still out there. He's asking for money. He's still saying he's Navajo. And what does this mean with the Navajo people that I know? You know, what do I, how do I approach them? How do I, you know, how, how am I to approach them if I just lay down and do nothing? Um, they really weighed on me heavily. So, so um, I can't single-handedly, you know, solve all of Indian country's problems, but in this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing, man, I had some sway. I had some sway. Um, so again, it's now spring 2005. Um, by this time, I had no communication with everybody, with, with Nazdij or with, you know, everything had deteriorated. My, I had called them out and, and was threatened with lawsuits and everything. So, they had the script, they were free to move forward with production if they wanted to. I created an anonymous email account and um, I reached out to a journalist out of New York, uh, actually at the New York Times. And I, I tell him sort of what's happening that I have information about this person. He responds and he's very, very cautious with me, which I get, right? He should be. And he says, look, I'm not in the business of outing people, but if you have information that somebody's defrauding the public, yeah, I'd like to know. So um, we set a time to talk. I tell him my entire story and he just keeps saying, oh my God, oh my God. He just kept saying that over and over. He said, look, I believe you, I believe you. This is a non-native person, um, an ally, an ally. So he gets the a journalist just right out of grad school by the name of Matthew Fleischer, Matt Fleischer, who again, another non-native ally. Um, they took the story to various outlets and they ended up selling it to the LA Weekly. The alt, uh, the alt uh, weekly here in LA back in its heyday. Um, they paid for the story. They sent Matt out. Um, first place he came was here. We went through Nazdija's books and we're pointing out inconsistencies and just things that didn't make sense. And 
And so then Matt just, you know, he goes off and he starts um, investigating, goes to the Navajo Nation, goes to Michigan, you know. During our correspondences, I referred to Nazgij as the Navajos, just out of, you know, just in email correspondences, I mentioned, referred to him as the Navajos. And, and Matt writes back and says, hey, would you mind if we use that? <laughs> I said, yeah, sure, we can have it. Um, so then a, a small light. So now it's late 2005, a small light kind of at the end of the tunnel starts to break. We're finding out about this guy. Um, that James Welch adaptation that I had done, the, um, uh, you know, the short film got into Sundance. Um, but more importantly was the stars started to line up in a really peculiar way. A couple weeks prior, I don't know if you remember, but there was, um, there were two literary scandals. The first one was JT Leroy, who um, was the pen name of somebody named Laura Albert. These were memoirs that weren't really memoirs and they were released to great acclaim, a film was made, blah, blah, blah. And it was revealed that these were not memoirs, they were in fact works of fiction. Right after that, like literally a week or two later, it was James Fry and A Million Little Pieces. And you may remember when he got um, eviscerated on Oprah, uh, like splayed open like a fish, it was, it was pretty great. Um, but yeah, he, so, so all of a sudden, fake memoirists are in the public consciousness, they're in the kind of part of the public discussion. So it's like, okay, this, this is the time to release it. So I'm there in Park City, it's 2006. And Matt says, all right, it's up. It's on the website. So I find I have to go out into the hallway uh, to get a Wi-Fi signal. And it pulls up and it's the Navajos. And I literally, I know what they say when they say the weight of the world lifts off your shoulders. I know what that feeling's like because literally, the world now knew what I knew. All the weirdness, the surreal, I mean, it was just everybody knew. Um, there was no Nazdij. There never was. There's just a very, very, very troubled man from Lansing, Michigan named Tim Barris. Um, he had been a writer of gay SM porn who had been drummed out of the gay lit community because, you know, he was just, A, he was a thief. He would tell him a crazy story that happened to you, then he would go around and say, this crazy thing happened to me. He just made a, he had no interior, so he just reflected back on everybody. Um, he was a thief, um, and his depictions of sex and sexuality were always very about pain and, you know, just there's nothing, you know, pleasurable. Um, there was no group home for boys, just the fantasies of a very, very, very sick man. There was no Tommy, nothing fancy. There was no Awi, who was the teen in his second book that he took care of. Uh, there was no brother named So. There was no Navajo mom. There was no abusive white cowboy father. All three books were works of fiction. Um, the first thing that Barris tried to do when he got outed was he tried to sell his story to the same publishing industry that he had been, you know, crapping on for years. Of course, it didn't go anywhere. Um, he then said he was going to drive his Jeep off a cliff. You know, I, I would have paid for gas money, but, you know, I didn't know how to get a hold of him. Um, his books were quickly taken off his shelves. Um, one was, I think, The Boy and the Dog Are Sleeping was part of some citywide read program at Salt Lake City, and they, they rescinded it. It became this hot topic for, you know, for, for a hot minute in the news cycle. Um, prominent Native writers offered their opinions in you know, Time Magazine and online, and, and which peeved me a little bit, I got to admit, because I had been through all this and I, you know, but it's my fault for not being part of the story. I was, I was so scared and I realized now that I had no reason to be, I had the truth. Um, the hippie never bothered to apologize to me. He never called. He never said, hey, man, I'm sorry for getting you involved in this. Um, he just went away. Um, and as far as I know, he's still teaching at that university in Southern California. Uh, Mumbles uh, left film, and I think he opened a wine bar that quickly went under. I, I have no desire to know anything about him. Um, and this whole thing set me back. You know, I mean, this whole episode set me back in so many ways. This should have been my big chance to, you know, this, I had the wind in my sails and it just stopped. It just stopped. Um, there's one thing I'm proud of, and that's the simple fact that this man used Indians and he was brought down by an Indian. And I can, I can say that. I can say that. But the problem, actually, to be honest, it seems to have gotten worse in the intervening years. It seems to have, it just, it's just, it's gotten bigger. I think a lot of that has to do with social media and you know social media requires one to create a a a version of themselves or somebody else and so it becomes this petri dish for frauds um 
you know, we we talk about we talk about this issue in really broad strokes. Like it is a social problem, but social problems always begin between individuals. You know, fake Indians create trauma at a personal level. At a personal level, it's not just based on my own experience, but I've been with other Indian people where they are. It is finally dawning on them that they have been used, and that they've been used personally, professionally, usually both, and it's painful. You know, it creates tears and, and disillusionment. The Indian person is in shock, kind of running, running through their mind, you know, all the things, all the clues that were there all along that they ignored. The pretendian doesn't have any concern for the Indian they've used. They, their only concern is their career. Um, so I end with, this is my, this is my narrative, um, but it's also, you know, all, all of our narratives. I know that there are people watching this that that have been through something like this at a university, um, you know, uh, in the arts, museums, whatever it may be. I know there are a lot of Indian people out there who've been who've been cheated and who've been taken advantage of by these people. And I think now is the time for us to tell our stories. Now is the time that we speak up and we use this as a weapon because they have, you know, they have things that they that they have their bag of tricks, but we need to develop ours as well. You know, we have the moral upper hand. And I think now is the time for all of us who have been who have been taken advantage of by these people to start telling our stories. So with that, um, there's a lot more to be said. I'll wait for the Q&A, but thank you for listening. Hausa Cedar, thank you so much. I appreciate those words and I hearing your story. It's very powerful and uh, we hope to hear more from you down the road as well. Um, our next speaker tonight, um, I'm honored to introduce as well as uh, Jacqueline Keeler. She's a citizen of the Navajo Nation and she is a Yankton Dakota descendant of descent. She is a writer journalist living in Portland, Oregon. The author of the recently released standoff Standing Rock the Bundy Movement and the American Story of Sacred Lands. She also edited Edge of Morning Native Voices Speak for the Bears Ears. Uh, I gotta say that I read Standoff and uh, used parts of it in my class and it's a, it's a remarkable book. It's one that I think we, should, we all should read. So Jacqueline, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, really was really moved by um, my Cedar's story. I mean, I, it was, you know, when these things happen to us, it sometimes feels like it doesn't carry the national weight that when it happens to other um, ethnic groups or, or other Americans. And, um, and so we've all been looking at Canada to see for Canada to, to, for First Nations folks to take the lead in fighting this issue for us, as we so often do here in the United States. And, um, but I, um, but I, I guess to introduce myself, my name is Jacqueline Keeler, and I am, as, uh, as Gordon said, I am Dene and Dakota, and um, I, my clan is Kia Ani Nishle, and I'm born for the Ihank Daman Dakota people. And, uh, I, uh, and I'm here on the, uh, the, you know, here in Portland, Oregon <laughs> and stuff. So I, I, um, I really, uh, I wanted to explain sort of what people know me most for is the list, the alleged pretendians list. And, and it's become rather notorious. Um, although I have to say that I always, when I, you know, whenever we talk about the issue, people just want to know where to find out who is, who is, you know, who is, who's been exposed as a fake, do you know what I mean? And the list that I put together has a lot of people who were exposed a long time ago, but people have forgotten, you know. Um, one example would be um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, right? She was outed in the 1970s by Suzanne Harjo as a fake Indian, uh, falsely claiming both Cheyenne and Cherokee descent. And uh, we've done her tree. She has none of those ancestries at all. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then she was outed once again in the 1980s um, by Aquasasne Notes, the historic and, and well-respected uh, native newspaper, uh, and, uh, and uh, by Hank Adams, you know, the late, the late Hank Adams, uh, an amazing um, uh, leader here in the Pacific Northwest with the fish ends and everything. And so she, she was exposed many times, and yet, you know, I had seen very recently very well-known PhDs, native PhDs, um, real native people, uh, writing papers with her, publishing, co-publishing books with her, right? And um, and then of course, uh, 
in October, she was on C-SPAN, right, promoting her latest book about guns. And, um, and the, uh, the, white, the white interviewer actually put her on the spot. He was like, you have claimed to be Native before, haven't you? And she denied it. And, uh, and he actually read from her book, uh, The Indigenous People's History of the United States. He read the author's uh, foreword, which is the first thing you would see if you open the book, uh, and where she clearly states uh, that her mother was Cherokee and died of shame of being Cherokee as an alcoholic. And once again, you see that really violent story that's supposed to silence any questions, right? And, um, and, and she was, I mean, it was interesting to see a white uh, reporter put her on the spot on live television. And yet so many Native people um, are, have no idea. And even Native professors who are teaching her book. Uh, I think her book is the best-selling book right now in Native studies, right? And, um, and so it's just seeing this, you know, being a journalist, working on this issue for quite a while. I published my first really my first coverage in 2015. Um, I covered the uh, Susan Taff Reed case where my alma mater, Dartmouth College, hired a, a fake Indian uh, to be uh, the, to run the Native American program at Dartmouth College, which is not a teaching program, but it is a retention program, a counseling program to make sure Native students graduate, right? And, um, and so to have an ethnic fraud in that position is, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I, I you know, it, it's so strange to think that you know, you're a 17 or 18 year old and you're going very far away from home and you're going to an Eastern college um, very upper class, you know, Hanover, New Hampshire, very, you know, fraternity oriented. Everyone has gone to an expensive school, prep school from the East Coast, you know, and, um, and you get there and the person who's counseling you is someone who's mimicking your identity back at you, right? It's, it's a form of, um, it's really a form of settler violence. Do you mean? And, uh, and so anyway, so I did a piece, I, I covered her story um, for Indian Country Day and also for, uh, for uh, the Daily Beast. And, um, and that, was, that was the first time I really started covering these stories. And, um, and actually, uh, you know, 2015 was the same year that Andrea Smith was pretty much definitively outed in Indian Country Day uh, by, um, by a consortium of Cherokee scholars and other, uh, other um, scholars, Native scholars, who uh, demanded she stop, right? Stop claiming to be Cherokee. And, um, and then of course, just this past year, uh, the New York Times uh, published an expose on her, yet she is still teaching at UC Riverside to this day, right? Um, I looked up her salary, um, all uh, public employees of public universities, you can look up their salary, right? And you know, she's making about $170,000 a year. And you know, I think back in 2011, she was making more like um, around 100,000. Um, but, uh, but, you know, on all that time, she's been making several hundred thousand dollars close to since she was first outed in 2015, you know, um, maybe close to almost 900,000 at this point. But that doesn't include, you know, um, book publishing, speaking engagements, other things, um, you know, uh, grants and fellowships. Uh, the amount of money these folks can rack in quite quickly is pretty astronomical. And, and this is part of what we're doing with the list is we're taking a look at the money. How much are they, how much have they, not only are we doing the genealogy, which is really the only way to out their, their, their lives, right? Uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, <laughs> but the, uh, but, but it's also the uh, issue is, uh, um, sorry, I just saw something pop up. But, uh, but uh, it's the only way to out their lies, but also uh, they're also taking a lot from Native people, taking a lot of opportunities. And in fact, uh, I was talking to um, a young woman who, who works in the um, um, art cur curator, uh, you know, the museum world, and she was saying that her one of her tribal leaders was asking, why are we even paying to, for these people to go to college to get these degrees when they can't even get the jobs? Because, and why can't they get the jobs? Because the jobs are be take, being taken by frauds. And so this is, um, I think, the uh, the first panel that we had. Um, you know, uh, the uh, the elder he took he did a great job um, explaining about how hard these programs, how we fought for these programs at places like Michigan State, at San Francisco State. It was Native people fighting for these programs so that we could be heard, right? And um, and we could have some sort of uh, begin to develop uh, an educated, you know, cadre of people of leaders. 
And, um, and he was saying at Michigan State, we now see the result of that. We have Brian Newland, who is, um, you know, who is the head of the, um, the BIA now, and he came onto that program. And, but when we are displaced from those programs and all the money that uh, our elders fought to get for us is taken over by um, white people mimicking the identity ad ad to each other, right? Uh, it becomes quite an untenable situation. And so uh, so I actually wanted to show some things here. Um, I'm gonna do a share screen thing here, um, see if I can see or not. Oh, it's not working very well. I'm just gonna choose one and see what happens here. It's not showing me what I'm gonna be sharing. All right, I didn't do that quite properly. Um, I was hoping to share some things. Um, it's not sharing right, okay. Let me see here so I can do this. Okay, very good. Sorry, I didn't do this earlier. Um, what I wanted to show you was an article, the article that actually that inspired this um, list. And, and it was an article written by a pretendian, right, in the New York Times. Um, the New York Times, of course, outed Andrea Smith pretty effectively, but they also published a pretendian in December of. Um, what was it, uh, December of, must have been December of 2020, right before, uh, and, um, and, and it, 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 there was a woman who was claimed, falsely claiming her, her late husband's tribal identification, her, his tribal identity, which was Hopi and Assiniboine. He was the medical doctor, had worked with the Hopi, his Hopi people, and he had died of cancer, sadly. And, um, and I think a later panel, you'll be hearing from his daughter and how she outed her stepmother, right? And, uh, but uh, so, you know, she, the New York Times apologized. They have, if you read her, um, it's, it was they actually tapped her to write the op-ed from the New York Times, the paper of note in this country, to basically celebrate the nomination of Deb Holland, a real native woman, Laguna Pueblo, to be uh, to be nominated to be Secretary of the Interior, right? And so here's this momentous occasion for native people, for native women in particular. And who do they have write the opinion piece in the New York Times? A pretendian, a white woman pretending to be Indian. And so um, I also wanted to show some of the list as well and explain some of the data around it. What the list has been able to present to us is a lot of information. Uh, you know, we uh, not only, and I also want to show how we can tell someone is not native. It's, um, so I'm going to uh, try right now, um, see if I can get this thing to share or not. Oh, I didn't realize I'd have to change my preferences on my computer. Here we go. Um, Sorry. Okay. Well, I let me see if I can get this to work. System preference. All right. Um, oh well. I will probably. What I will do, I think, is I will. Um, I will <laughs> actually maybe put together um, something and share it on my um, on my social media, maybe on my Instagram, and so people can see it. Um, but the. Uh, but yeah, the um, I was hoping to be able to show you guys some of the actual data we look at. I mean, when we're when we're taking apart someone's tree, we are we're taking apart, we, when we put together someone's tree. There's a lot of information on that tree that people don't seem to realize exists, and um, and we're able to quite clearly show if someone is native or not. Often, uh, pretendians will say that their ancestor did not um, was was more of an Indian than our ancestors. You know that we're paper Indians, and that uh, and therefore their their ancestors were better than us, right? Than all of us who are enrolled, right? All of us who are who who are paper Indians. And uh, and, and it's interesting when I first covered this issue in 2015 for the Daily Beast. I interviewed a lot of uh, this woman, uh, Susan Taff Reed, who is now a dean at Dartmouth. They actually didn't get rid of her. They they simply um, promoted her up to being a dean. And um, she actually uh, was claiming to be Lenape and she was head of this fake Lenape tribe uh, that uh, actually her uh, her grandfather had founded, her grandfather's ancestry he claimed to be uh, a Delaware descendant. And, um, and in fact, his ancestors only came to this country in around uh, 1902 from Ireland. The Delaware Lenape had been remo removed from Pennsylvania between the 1830s and 1850s. There's no way that he was actually uh, a Delaware descendant. I mean, some of these trees 
are very cut and dry. Like it's pretty obvious these people aren't Indian, you know? And, uh, and so she, uh, so, I mean, almost all of them are pretty cut and dry actually. And, uh, and so uh, she denied, she claimed that her ancestors had stolen the identity of an Irish family. You really, you can't, you can't keep a good pretendian down. Like they just will constantly move the goalposts, make it harder and harder to, uh, to verify their, their, their claims. So we, the people, the 200 people we have on our list are either people who have been outed definitively already in the past through lawsuits or all kinds of things, or um, like Jaime S. Storm, you know, the Cheyenne Nation took their, his publisher to court in the 1970s and they definitively proved in court that he was not Cheyenne. Some of the folks on the list, this, is, this list represents the work of so many native people, right? Or it's not my list, it's, it's a curated list of work that native people have done to expose fraud. And that's probably why the fraud rate is so high. It's 97%, 97% we cannot verify that they are native, that they are the kind of tribe that they claim. And we base, it, we base their, we, we test, we, try, we verify their actual stated claims. Like what are they claiming, right? And that is what we verify. And since these people are professional natives in that they are monetizing the claim in some way, they, we have many, many sources to, to see what they were claiming, you know, their own books where they will write in their books how they are native, what tribe, how they, they claim it. And then, of course, you know, on the record interviews, uh, even congressional testimony where they've gone before Congress to represent us and they've stated into the, into the testimony who, how they're native. Right. And so we use that and we, we try to verify what they have said. So we're not verifying blood quantum. Right. Unless they've claimed some sort of blood quantum. We're not verifying, uh, you know, enrollment. Right. Unless they've claimed to be enrolled. We are clear. We are verifying their claim. So so if they're claiming to be of descent. We verify that we look for uh, someone from that tribe who is in their family tree. Right. And um, and so that's all we do. You know, we don't do anything else. And that's the oh, that's that's the standard they have to meet. And it's a pretty simple standard. Right. It's not really that hard. If you, you know, and so, and so, yeah, so we, uh, so, so this, uh, this woman, Susan Taffreed, right, her grandfather had started this, his sort of his nonprofit tribe in uh, Pennsylvania in the late 70s. And so by the 1990s, her father was involved as well. Him, um, a bunch of people who were associated with his group ended up going to prison in the 1990s. In Ohio, they were sentenced for running sex magic Lenape sweat lodges where they molested 13 year old girls, right? And, um, and you know, you try to tell Dartmouth College, hey, it's not a good idea to have, you know, the head of your Native American program be executive director of a nonprofit where, where you know, um, officers of that nonprofit went to, to, you know, to prison for molesting children, you know, in, in sweat lodges, you know, it just went in when they just weren't, didn't know how to comprehend what I was telling them. And, um, and so, I mean, to me, that's basic risk management as an organization is not to hire people who have that kind of history or representing an organization like that. And so, uh, so anyway, but uh, but it was very clear that she was not native and yet she to this day will will introduce herself as a female chief. And so it um, and also talking to a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, ge genealogists, historians, they explained, you know, why the documentation is so good, particularly for the Cherokee Nation. Right. And uh, and this notion that there's all these hidden people you know, all over the place who are secretly hiding out this whole time, you know, and one uh, Cherokee scholar explained to me this way, they were like, you know, imagine, I mean, this is like your relatives being sent off to Auschwitz, right? And, and you, but you're going to stay behind and stay with your Nazi in-laws and stay there, right? And, um, and, and, you know, say goodbye to your little niece and nephew and your grandmother and everyone else and just watch them go and maybe they're going to die, you know, but you're going to stay here, right? Because you're the bigger Indian. And, um, and the stories, if you look at them within the context of the history themselves, don't make any sense, actually, you know, which is why it's particularly strange that Native American studies PhDs are falling for these stories, right, and, and refusing to look, refusing to verify. And uh, so they, um, but yeah, the, you know, I think, uh, so, you know, so what I'm saying, when we look at the trees, we don't just look at that one ancestor. If they ever name an ancestor, they usually don't name the ancestor. But if they name the ancestor, we look at that line very carefully and we build out the trees. So we find their cousins, their grandparents, their great, great grandparents, their second cousin nine times removed. We look at the entire tree, 
And we look for anybody who has any ties, living with the tribe, enrolled, you know, anything at all. And what we find is just more white people because these white people are all documented, you know, and, and many of these white people, you know, and then we also call the family. We call members who are completely unaware that this, I mean, it's just, you know, this is, this is, this is rampant fraud that's going on and we're documenting it. And the, the investigation around the list documents it on a huge scale. The 200 people that we looked at, you know, the fact that 97% of them cannot, you cannot verify their claims right? It, it, it's, it's quite, it says for one thing, because the list was basically created by Native people who suspected fraud, right, who, or who had already outed fraud. Native people know who the frauds are, you know what I mean? And, it's, and so this list is, 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 a, is representative of that collective knowledge. The fact that we are being denied access to this information, you know, really is, is, is speaks to the need of the frauds to basically protect themselves and not any interest in us and our needs as a people. Right. And, um, and, and you have to understand that when these frauds get into gatekeeping positions, right. And uh, I mean, you know, their main focus is not actually on helping us on our issues. Their main focus is maintaining that position and keeping anyone out who could threaten them. So we've lost a lot in all of this. We've lost a lot of leadership. We've lost a lot of, um, you know, we, we've, we probably, we've lost books, literature, right. We've lost, you know, I mean, we, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of young Native people contacted me, right? And they were telling me how, you know, they went off to school, they went to, you know, their Ivy League schools or law school, and they had all these dreams of helping Native people. And what happened when they got there, they were confronted with fakes. And when they asked that, when they lightly challenged those fakes, they were basically pushed out. And, and they were, the violence that was done to them is such that it made them realize that they're not the people they were before. They're not, they don't have that desire anymore, you know? And so it's, you know, it's, it's what does it take from us for people to pretend to be Indian, right? To be, you know, to, to be professional Indians. And, and that, you know, and so, you know, looking at the financial takings is really important, I think. And that's what we are doing as well. I wish I could show you the data and stuff. I had not able to pull it up right now, but I will put it up and, People can peruse it at their leisure. And, uh, and, and I also wanted to show the trees to show you that, hey, these people really are not native. There's really no question about it. You know? And uh, they're just able to constantly push these stories and with no, with no, uh, no one at all um, questioning them. I mean, and I, you know, I, I sometimes tell when people, you know, young people generally come to me and they want advice on how to deal with this issue in their, in their schools, wherever they're at. And I say, for one thing, don't talk about an individual because once you, you know, I really compare this to, um, I really compare this to a con artist, a confidence man or a confidence woman, someone who is very good at getting your confidence, right? And if you make it about them as individuals, right, they're able to really pull those emotional ties and really pull in the defense mechanisms, right? And uh, if we look at the structure and we look at the data and we look at exactly what's going on, you know, not, not their, you know, not, not their emotional ties to us that they kind of put into us, right? But we look at what is actually going on, you know? And so I tell these young people, explain, you just explain it with, take the person out of the picture, right? You know, go to your administrator, go to whoever and say, look, if you really think that you can hire someone and they're not, and, and if they, all they have to do is dye their hair black and tie, tan up their skin and go in there and say, I'm an Indian. I mean, give, you know, it's like, you know, don't, how can you tell that they're not lying? Uh, if you don't check, right? And, and the only way to check right now, especially since not, very few of these people are claiming to be enrolled in a tribe, they are claiming descent, right? And so the only way you can check to see if they are of descent is to do their genealogy. It's basically the only way to check. And so, you know, we really, you know, there are a lot of, you know, <laughs> you know, so that, that's, uh, that's sort of where we're at right now. And, and um, so, but I, I wish I had my, I had a different presentation with all my, my charts and everything, but I will put that up as well later. Right. Well, we're gonna open the questions now. Thank you, Jacqueline. Apologies for the uh, the screen share. We have you as coach, so I don't, I'm not sure why it wasn't working. It must have been something. Yeah, I, I, I updated my um my 
<laughs> my um, operating system and then I, I didn't reset the um, permissions. And, yeah, so anyway, that's my fault. Oh, Sorry. No worries. Okay, good. So we have, we were open to questions now. We're going to look uh, in the Q&A. We have one in there now. Um, Jacques, uh, do, you, you can read them if you want. Can you see them, Jacqueline, if you click on the Q&A? Uh, if not, I can read it. Um, <laughs> you got it or no? Oh, go ahead, uh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll just, how do we defend ourselves from the aggressiveness of the pretendians once they are publicly denounced by indigenous voices? This is this is the big part of it, and I think that what has really uh, been really apparent talking to other native people is that the level of violence. This is a form of settler violence. It's it's really ugly, and um, I think that Trevino uh, in his in his discussion on you know giving it a labor framing. Um, you know, was really important because, uh, you know, and, and, you know, what we're doing is we're actually calculating the financial takings, right? Not only of what the individual is taking, but also if they have a huge pretending, they have a huge settler family tree. You know, I mean, these trees are enormous, these family trees. I, you know, we look at like, if someone has, I mean, before the 20th century, families were gigantic. So you're talking about the pioneer family with 12 kids, a pilgrim family with 12 kids, almost all of them are living in these trees. They're not dying. It's not like 30% die off. And each of them get married and they each get their own farm. And guess where that farmland comes from? It comes from us, it comes from Indian land. So if you take this massive tree and you know, 12, generation, 12, 12 people, one generation, and then you, you multiply that again with them each getting 12 kids, you can see how quickly that really, the number just becomes enormous. This huge white family, this huge white settler colonist family that has benefited financially from us, from taking from us to an enormous amount of money. Right, and uh, and 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 so the, this person with this giant white family family tree should be suddenly right, having the right to speak for us is pretty crazy, and and so you know I think that um, you know just looking, I, it's all part of a taking, and and I think that we need to actually document it, and if we're, as long as we're being told and being scared off and being bullied into not looking, you know. It's, um, it's never going to change. We all have to decide together that we are going to start asking questions and, and, and not buy um, you know, the con artist line. Good. Thank you. So there's another that came up that said, uh, and Cedar, you know, take a pass at these two if you feel up to it and want to. Um, of course, uh, someone writes, what is your advice for when academic institutions are just as invested in someone's claim to indigeneity as the pretendians? themselves are. Any thoughts on that? On that? Where is... What is your advice from an academic institution? So much of the discussion centers around, <clears throat> around the ac academics uh, or academia, um, but I'm coming at it from, from the arts. Um, from culture production. So, um, I mean, that, that could easily be, be sort of transferred to, you know, institutions like, uh, well, you know, any big film institution. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's slow process, I mean, of us speaking up. And I mean, we, our job is to change the narrative, to change the stream, you know, um, that takes all of us, all of us telling our stories. Um, it will take time. I, I don't know. What is your advice for academic? Yeah, I mean, maybe somebody who, who is in academia could answer this a little bit better than I can. But yeah, it is, it is something that's going to take um, a concerted effort and multiple fronts. Again, I think narrative is going to be really key to this, to changing the, the tide. Um, in addition to, you know, amending the Indian Arts and Crafts Act and getting tribes to step up and um, institute policies using tribal courts. Um, I think it's really ironic. We're in a moment of um, everybody is trying to outwoke each other. All these, all these universities are, what are they uh, with the uh, land acknowledgements? But I mean, it's all this kind of performative wokeness. It's this hypocrisy because they're still not communicating with the tribes whose land that they are on. And they need to be called out on that, on that front. I think that the land issue is really important. I mean, uh, so with, with dealing with it in academia, so, you know, uh, you know, the issue there is that um, 
what is academia exactly? I mean, it is a white institution that was never meant to actually have anything to do with this. I mean, I actually sat on the uh, the Native uh, um, Alumni Board at Dartmouth, and I remember uh, we were dealing with what well, we were dealing with the issue there of fraud, ethnic fraud, and um, and the and really. You know, it was funny to uh, and <laughs> to be told that basically what we really needed to be doing so the administration would listen to us is raise more money. You know, that the Black alumni at Dartmouth had given $5 million. We needed to just pony up more money and we'd be listened to. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and I was thinking like, you know, if I had $5 million, I wouldn't give it to Dartmouth College. Do you know what I mean? I would, give it to, I would give it to a tribal college. I would make sure that that money went and stayed in our own communities. And this is part of the problem, I think, is that these, these um, institutions were never meant to really help us. They were never meant to be about us. And if they could find a way to, to turn that, to turn allegedly help to us on its head, they would instinctually find that, do you know what I mean? And, uh, and I feel like this is part of the aspect too. It's not just the individual fraudsters, but it's the fact that uh, white, soci white settler society has never wanted to really um, deal with us in a way that is um, honest or that is, truthful, I think, um, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised that these institutions are, are preferring the performer to, uh, to our actual uh, lived experiences. You know, I think uh, the performer, uh, you know, the white performer of, of native identity is indulging in a fantasy, right? They're live action role players. They are cueing into the performance in a way that appeals to white people. Right, and, uh, and and they can do it much better than we can. You know, they're not burdened by anything that we are burdened by. You know, and uh, I, I just been working on a story now about residential schools in Canada, and you know, um, I'm my, my family are my mother's Navajo from the Navajo Nation. Um, that part of the family they kind of missed out on the whole residential the boarding school thing because. Um, you know, my grandparents were traditional Navajos, they didn't speak English, they never went to school, their generation really didn't, um, you know, and by the time my mom got out there, there was public schools, and, but I mean, from, you know, to read what my husband, my husband's family are from Six Nations on the, on the Grand River up in Canada, and, you know, and, and his family went to the Mohawk Institute, and, and to read what happened to them there, and it makes me understand more, like, when I, you know, when I, my, my dad is uh, Yankton Sioux, and so his, his experience was different because my grandmother, her, her, um, her aunt, Ella Deloria, ran the school she went to, um, so that was a really different experience, you know, uh, but um, we all have our individual experiences. They're all different. They're not the same for our families and our tribes, but I, when I first spoke to my husband, to my in-laws, I was really surprised. I mean, that they were very, there was just this, this, this big block, you know, there was, you know, talking to his his grandmother you know and and you know the, the level of there's this shame there that I wasn't you know with my traditional Navajo grandparents they were very confident they were very the Navajo way was the right way they were just so you know they just had such a big a spirit about them do you know what I mean that was inspiring to see as a, as a grandchild do you know what I mean and then you know my my Dakota grandmother she was more playful you know like about it you know but the see that there's just the pain there was just so was really something I was not that familiar with, you know, even as a as an Indian person, and um, but then to read what they went through, you know, the level of of, of hurt and and suffering and degrade 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 the, de the degradation, you know, you understand why it's hard to play Indian for white people when you've gone through that, you know, and um, you know her her husband was a chief of. Um, um, Bear Clan chief there, and he also spoke six of the eight languages there, you know, but I mean, it's, you know, still the level of, of pain, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. That's why we can't compete with frauds, because the frauds, it's, it's a form of escapism for them, right, from their actual, their actual reality, you know, be playing Indian is escapism, and, and so it's easier for them to do it, Right to spend all their time embroidering the identity, learning our languages, do mimicking us, studying our social media, doing all of these things is so much easier for them to do than it is for for us to actually be Indian, to actually deal with what we've been dealt, right, and um, and try to understand that that big gap between what we want and what we actually feel and we actually have, and 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 so you know. This is why we need to be able to deal with our issues without being babysat by settlers mimicking us, right? We need to be able to just deal with our issues. We need to be able to 
advocate for our nations without them sitting there wanting to basically stand in front of us and, and grandstand for dollars, right? We have to stop this. And, and we can't, you know, we, and we, the way to stop it is to ask questions and not be told no. I see there was one, um, someone talking about how in Canada, they uh, allow Britannians and white institutions to prosecute and criminalize anyone who asks you questions. You know, here in the United States, I don't think that's so much the case. I mean, there, there is a lot, a lot of administrations in universities that don't understand the law there actually is, as Trina mentioned before, there actually is a legal, there is an Indian preference in the case law. So all of those things, like when I was doing reporting on the Susan Taffrey thing, when Dartmouth College and many universities I speak to will say, well, we can't, we can't um, actually, you know, check to see if someone is native because that violates the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, all this stuff. But actually, Indian preference is the one exception to the other, to those. Things. They can actually do that. Right. And, and so they don't know the law themselves. They need to be educated. Right. And then secondly, you know, they, the frauds, if they want to bring a suit, a lawsuit right against me or anyone else, but then when they go to court, they're going to actually have to prove that they are native because there's no standing. They don't have any standing to sue unless they can prove it. Right. And, uh, you know, and so many, you, so many of these folks have gone, have gone to court, the ones that we've called out, and they've been shown in court to not be able to prove that they are native. You know, and so it's, um, and on top of that, if we do go to court, I get to do discovery on them. I get there, I get to ask for all kinds of things for them that I normally couldn't ask. Like, I want to see your income taxes, you know, just like Trump, they're very, they're very, they don't want me to see their income taxes. You know, so there's a lot of ways in which they actually don't, they're bluffing. They actually don't have a very strong situation there. And uh, legally, in every way, they do not have a very strong, all they have is that they can input fear into us and bully us and make us stop asking questions. So they can basically, you know, I mean, you know, in, in my father's people, the Dakota people, they call them washishi, right? The stealers of the fat, right? And this is what they're doing. They're stealing the fat again, right? And I think that we need to just you know, um, and, and, you know, it's, it, the trauma is real. And I think that we do need to, to create support circles so we can share that and safe spaces and heal from that. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite, um, you know, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people over the past couple of years and, and, um, and, and they've shared what they've gone through with me. And you know, I get contacted every single day by Native people and um, reporting fraud and also explaining what had happened to them when they confronted fraud and, and the, 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 the violence and the pain that it causes uh, when the, the fraudster is fighting to keep the con going is, is quite a, a extreme. And so, but I, I, they actually don't have a very strong legal stance because they can't prove what they're saying is true. And, um, and, and they open themselves up in a court of law to, um, for me getting their income taxes, which I would really like to get, <laughs> in fact. So, uh, yeah. So. so Jacqueline, do you mind if I, if I pick up a few of these questions in the thread here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one, one that I found, there are actually two I found very interesting that came up. One was that, uh, do either of you know if there have been reparations made by these pretendians once they've been out? It seems that they don't try to repair the harms they did toward Native nations. Um, that's the first. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the second after this. Any, anything like that you ever heard of? So I had mentioned before that lawsuit in the 70s. Um, I don't know if I'm spelling his name. It's Jaime Estra Storm or something like that. Um, he wrote that book, Seven Arrows. Do you remember that book? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And it came out in the 70s and he claimed to be Cheyenne and that he was sharing these Cheyenne ceremonies and everything. It, it came out at 72 or something. I can't remember exactly. And um, I was going to Google it, but I can't. But anyway, um, but uh, the Cheyenne uh, Nation actually took his publisher to court. Right. And they took his publisher to court and they got a settlement because, uh, of course, he could not prove he, he was not Cheyenne at all. And they got a settlement and they were um, and the publisher uh, now has to basically hand over the profits to them. Right. And also make sure that people know that it's a, it's a book of fiction and stuff. And um, and then the person is not actually Cheyenne. And so there's one case where they there's some sort of reparations did take place. Um, so far, that hasn't happened. So far, uh, the matter has been made so confused. I mean, we are not a race. You know, often uh, they discuss this issue in terms of race, but we are not a race. Uh, we are citizens of tribal nations, and we could be of any perceived race, right? It, it just that is not an issue. Uh, and so, uh, so they, but they try to make it quite confusing about who we are. And um, and with the land part of it, you know, 
uh, I see someone asking about um, folks coming from um, South America. You know, to me, part of the issue that we have as um, as as native people for, to the area the United States claims, right? The land base they claim they're occupying our homelands, right? This is an active occupation, a military occupation. You know, the military response at Standing Rock made that occupation, the military nature of it visible to the world. People didn't read it that way, they didn't understand it that way, but that's, it was an actual military, it's an actual military occupation. And whenever we challenge it, we get confronted with violence, right, by the state. And so it's, uh, this is a colonial occupation. And, uh, and we, as the people who, whose land this is, we have a certain we have a certain political um, sort of reason to want to exist and to address these issues that no one else has. No matter where they come from in the world, they do not have the issue that we have here on this land, right? I mean, you know, if I went up to Canada and First Nations and started to try to speak on behalf of them, they'd be like, "What are you doing here? You know, you don't have any." you know, you have no standing to speak. Or if I went to Mexico and, you know, tried to, you know, I mean, the, we have issues here, very serious issues that we need to deal with that pertain to us because of our connection to the land itself, right? It defines us as a people. I, um, in my book, Stand Up, I go in a, through the difference between a colonist and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a people, right, with a capital P, which is what most of us call ourselves, you know, Dene means the people, you know, the five-fingered beings. You know, we, we have a specific connection. Our identity is built on our connection to the land, not to a profit motive, not to a capitalistic machine, right? It's built to, or a job, it's built to our relationship to the land that made us a people. Those agreements we made when we, we met with the, you know, the holy people or with you know, the white buffalo calf woman, we made those agreements with the land and all the other people already on the land, you know, the Buffalo Nation, all of these people, the Mount, the Holy Mount, everything. This is how we are a people. So our land, our, the land itself makes our situation very different than people who are coming from other places, right? And, and that really needs to be acknowledged and needs to be central. If someone really is our ally, they will allow us that, right? They're not gonna try to brush us aside with these sort of generic terms like indigeneity. I mean, technically humans, all humans are indigenous to somewhere, aren't they? I mean, it's sort of, we have particular issues with the ongoing occupation of our homelands and that differentiates us from any other group in the same way First Nations people have issues that deal with how Canada is occupying their lands. And so, you know, I think that that needs to be much more understood. Right now it's being really, you know, sort of um, cl clouded, right? Um, because of the, the forces being put on us by pretendians who are in academia and other places and trying to make sure that that is not clear. So the next one I had have I, I thought that was a good question, and perhaps will will help us. I, I I don't really have a good answer to this either, but I, I'm sure you both have some thoughts on it. How do we nurture allyship while calling out blatant cultural appropriation without potentially creating a supervillain who shifts the infatuation into a hatred? Does that make sense? The other question, or do you have a th thoughts on it? I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. Um, <laughs> How do we allyship? Allyship. I mean, the people who who stepped up for me, these 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 two men, um, these two journalists were were not native, nor did they ever pretend to be. So they were allies in the truest sense. Um, how do we? So yeah, I mean, there are there are those allies who are out there who you are using their areas of expertise to to help Indian Indian country. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, I'm I'm still trying to understand. Sort of, there there's a lot of stuff in that in that question. Um, yeah, I think um, well, this is this is the thing where that 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 does constitute bullying. I mean, it's yeah. um, you know, we should be we should have if they really are our allies, they would they'd be willing to hear our point of view. Do you mean? And um, you know, I think and and you know, people don't have to pretend to be Indian to be our allies. Do you know I mean, they can do this work without ever claiming. You know, I mean. Uh, it's just completely unnecessary. They do it because of ego and clout, and I suspect a lot of them are narcissists. You know, uh, they don't have a lot of empathy for us at all, and uh, it's more about themselves. And so I think, uh, you know, I mean, I, to me, often, some we, you know, I was telling someone, like, we, as Indian people, we don't, we don't live in the tight communities we used to live in. You know, where 
you know, a clad mother might watch the children growing up and then know which one to pick to be the leader. We don't have that anymore. We live very distant from each other. And, um, and we don't really know who these people are, you know, who are on uh, social media, who are even, you know, uh, our, 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 our academics, our celebrities. We don't really know them very well, you know. And often uh, the only way we do get to know them is actually through issues like this, who they really are right, what their character is. And so, you know, I think um, sometimes, you know, if, if someone is going to be violent to you, you know, because you're doing, you're asking, you know, questions they don't want you to ask, uh, that person is probably not someone who, who you really want to be around anyway, you know? And so it's a litmus test of character. And, and so, you know, I choose to work with people who, who, are, um, who are not in it for themselves, but who are in it for the people, right? I don't do this work for myself. I don't even do it because I want my children to be able to profit off of it. I mean, to me, my identity is not a monetized thing. I, I often bring up the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm enrolled in the Navajo Nation. Like I also qualify to enroll in the Yankton Sioux Tribe, um, although because both of my tribes uh, won't allow dual enrollment, I had my parents had to choose, right? Uh, my children are enrolled in the Navajo Nation. Um, the, uh, you know, I think, um, but, you know, and I, and I have, um, I sat down and add, I have 54 first cousins, right? And then three sisters. So that's, that's what, 58, 58 cousins, right? All together, all of us together. And out of all of that group, almost none of them monetize their identity. Like, it's pretty rare. I mean, most Native people don't put their identity on their resume. It's just extraordinarily rare. And, uh, and in that case, it being so rare, you know, why not why not verify who these people are? Do you know I mean it's uh, most Indian people do not put their identity uh, on their resume, right? My mother-in-law doesn't. I can't think of anyone in my husband's family who does it. You know, uh, it's just um, it's pretty uncommon. Most Indian people just have regular jobs. They they you know they apply for you know positions just like everybody else. You know, it's not a profession. It, it's their it's their actual identity. It's their actual families, their lives. You know, I mean, you know, for all my cousins who don't put Indian on their resume, you know, but if you know if the windmill breaks down and grandma and grandpa need a new one, everyone tr contributes, right? And or ceremony needs to happen, everyone comes in and helps. You know, the cattle need to be rounded up, everyone comes out and, and works, right? That's what being Indian is about. It's not about you know uh, any of this performative stuff. Um, to me, that is just for most Native people, they don't go around giving prayers and presiding over things. You know, that's a private thing. You know, our ceremonies are private. And, um, you know, at, my grandfather was a traditional Navajo man. He was a hand trembler. You know, he was a really great singer. They love to take him and, and go have him do the sings, you know, with the medicine man. You know, it's, but, you know, he never went around you know, uh, being kind of a, a guru to white people, uh, he was there for us, for our family, you know, and for our community. Uh, this sort of performative stuff is just completely unnecessary. We don't need it, you know. It only serves the uh, the performer, right? Uh, native being native is not about uh, you know branding or marketing yourself. It, it's just about living, about life, and being a good relative. And, and no one, people may never know that you did those things or that you were that person. Or it only matters to your family. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Brian Haley's on Jackie, and he requested that you tell a little bit about about his story. Um, uh, I don't know if you know. Uh, how you feel about that, but I'm, I'm good with it. If he, if he is as well, he's requested that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so the LA times, did some really great reporting, uh, back in, uh, was it 2019? I think December, 2019, they did a piece about, um, exposing a fake Chumash guy. Right. And, uh, and so I, uh, I ended up interviewing a lot of Chumash people after reading the article. I spent like a whole month interviewing. I was going to go, this was right before COVID broke, and I was going to spend March 2020 going to um, going down to uh, down to Southern California, um, the Malibu area, and interviewing people on the ground, right? I didn't get a chance to do that. Um, but um, but what I learned um, in doing all this reporting and interviewing was that um, was that there was the very strange history, and I, and I actually did a podcast with Pollination about it, uh, which is, so this, this guy's name was Matiwaya, 
right? And it turned out that his real name was, I think, uh, this is off the top of my head, but I think it was Frank Roca, right? And um, and he his what, what you find often sometimes in these people who are uh, what we found a lot with, um, particularly you know, with like when I did Rebecca Roanhorse's uh, family tree, her real name was Rebecca Parrish. Uh, you know, what we found was that, you know, her family were Hispanic, New Mexican, right? And uh, her birth family, her birth mother, and had no, we could find no documented. Um, and I worked with this on AC Agoya, who wrote the article for Indians.com, outing her as, 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 as a, as a, as the, what do you call her, the uh, Elizabeth Warren of the sci-fi set or something. And um, and so uh, what we found was that her family were actually the descendants of the conquistadors, the Spanish conquistadors. I mean, it was an amazing, it's, an, I will make it public, it's an amazing tree. I mean, she's, a, she's related to pretty much every major Spanish conquistador you can think of, right? It's, I haven't seen a tree like it since. I mean, I've done other Hispanic New Mexican trees. Hers was by far the most prestigious in that sense, if you want to call that prestige, right? And, um, and but we could find no Indians in her tree, right? We did find one woman from 1620 who came with a conquistador to Mexico from, from Mexico to Santa Fe, right? And um, and he and she her last name was Indio, which you can presume means that she was Indian, but we don't know anything else about her. We don't know. She obviously came from Mexico, um, and, um, and but we don't know what nation. We know nothing about her, and, and that is not a very strong claim because she was claiming a very a specific Pablo Oque Wingate, right? And she's claiming to be like the first Native woman to be on the top, you know, New York Times thing and all this stuff. And then she went and sold the Navajo twin story to Netflix for a million dollars. I mean, they just really go crazy marketing and, and making money off of these claims, and. Um, and so, so we did, I saw that was the first time I'd really seen sort of, you, you learn a lot by looking at these trees as well. I have to say, looking at pretendian trees, you really learn about history. You learn about how the land was taken, how the violence was done in detail. You know, I mean, I read letters written by her. I mean, a whole generation of her family were killed by Indians in 1680 during the Pueblo Revolt. I mean, you just, just like a whole, they all have the death date of 1680, you know. And I was reading a letter written by one of her ancestors who was a, um, he was a military, a Spanish military leader. I think they call them um, sergeants. I think, I remember, but um, but anyway, uh, at uh, what is now um, uh, Zuni, what is Zuni Pueblo, which was then Zuni Pueblo then, and um, and he was part of the garrison there. And he's writing a letter about how all the Navajos and the Zunis and the Pueblos and the Hopis, they're all work. He knows they're all working together to come and like attack them. And that was the first time I ever found out that Navajos took part in the Pueblo Revolt. I wasn't aware of that. It's so funny. I learned it from reading a letter written by her ancestor um, at that time. And um, so, um, but, uh, and then, but when I looked at uh, um, the Chumash issue, right, you know, the, the, the Spanish empire going into my people's an land and killing us and raping us and trying to convert us to Christianity and all of these things that they did, right, that happened in the early 1600s, started in the 1600s. What happened in Santa Barbara, right, that happened a century later. Right in, in the and so that was um so and those folks you know the um uh the uh, folks coming from they came from more more just north of Mexico City that you know, went up to Santa Fe there's that Potosi silver mines they came from that area, but the um, folks going to Santa Barbara uh, were coming from Sinaloa Mexico you know where El Chapo the drug dealers from and um and so they came up through there right and they came and um and the thing is like one of the things that I I really think is very important to know is that. Being being a native person is not so much about having the DNA, right? I wouldn't say that. It is actually about, I think, being um, is your the, the the standard I apply is this is that is your family a member of a native community in active resistance against the colonial occupation of your lands? Are is that you? Is that your family, or are you there administering that occupation? Right. If you're there, if you appeared there, if your ancestors appeared there in Santa Barbara as part of the administration of the King of Spain's occupation of California Indian people, you know, and the taking of their lands, you are not, <laughs> you know, that is not, you, 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 have, you have disassociated yourself from the collective community that has a very different social organization and objective. Native people have the social objective, which is completely different than that of empire of, of the sort of uh, colonial kind of 
um, colonial capitalistic endeavors, right? And you know, my book, Stand Up, I go into a lot of detail examining the capitalistic underpinnings of our of, of the original uh, colonies, right? The the English colonies, you know, the uh, starting with Virginia, those were actually started out as corporations, right? You know, the uh, the Virginia Company of London Adventures, you know, it was a for profit capitalistic adventure, which was then given, uh, you know, by the Queen or by the Crown, you know, was given uh, dominion, right? Uh, governmental powers over a certain over our lands, right? And and that is that 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 sort of model has remained the same ever since. So if you are part of that endeavor, a capitalistic endeavor of colonization, if your family is there to do that work, you are not a native person to that area. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's it's very simple, you know. And uh, no matter what color your skin. You know, and so it's um, and you know, so it's very you know, so so that so going into what you know, Brian, Dr. Haley was talking about, what happened in Santa Barbara was that a lot there a lot of these fake what I call I like to call them mishmash chumash. I think his term is neo chumash. There grew this whole I, I go through the whole history of it. It's really fascinating. This Grandpa Simu with you know even the Grateful Dead gets involved. This whole thing happened, this mix of things happened in the 60s and 70s that created, that gave rise to all these sort of fake Chumash tribes, right? And, um, and, and people who were trying to take their Spanish colonial ancestry and try to turn it into something that was more meaningful to them. But at the same time, displacing and removing the actual descendants who had survived the atrocities their ancestors had overseen, right? So it's, um, I think it's, it's really important you know, it, it's not enough to have one grandmother's, you know, you know, six generations back who was Indian, right? Because you have to think like if they were, I mean, six generations back, what are you talking, you know, it's 32, 64 people, you know, in that generation, if you think of 64 great, great, great grandparents, right, sitting in a room together, and there's one Indian woman, and there's 63 white people, Europeans, what does that even mean? You know, all those 63 Europeans didn't mean a darn thing to create who you are today. It's completely ludicrous. And, uh, you know, like, as I said, that also those 63 white people also have, you know, 11 siblings each, right? And each of those siblings are giving birth to 12 more, you know, colonists, you know, it's this huge number of white people in your family tree and you can't ignore it. You can't ignore what they did what they did to us, you know, how they profited off of it. You cannot deny it. You have to res be responsible and, and really begin to really grapple with colonialism and your real inheritance, right? Your real inheritance in order to be a true ally that has to happen. We can't deal in lies here. We can't deal in fantasies. We have to deal with things that would actually change the situation. Sorry, yeah, it had this one for Cedar. Has Cedar been able to rebuild his artistic career after being part of the Navajo? Yeah, I mean, I'm still working. I'm still, you know, I was, <clears throat> I was um, working with a producer at a big, one of the big um, streaming services and developing a thing that I want to shoot on my reservation. I, I don't, if there were more Indians in the industry, like Indians, <laughs> you know, not people like this, then they would understand sort of where, you know, where I was coming from. And, and um, it's set in the 80s. I actually want to shoot it on my, in my community. Um, but um, yeah, no, I've, I've been working on that for a while. Um, so with Tribeca and my first year with them, and AFI, but yeah, I'm still, I'm still at it. I'm still at it. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, somebody had also asked about Southern California. Yeah, let me yeah. scroll there. Let me see if I can find that. I saw that as well. Oh uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's become a thing where people are claiming here in our in, in our neck of the woods um, are starting to claim um, not just descendancy but enrollment in 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 Southern California tribes. Um, there's a family here in LA, a prominent sort of you know uh, uh, Gabrielino family that. Um, <laughs> The matriarch of which of whom um, gave herself a fake tribal ID number, uh, assigned herself a fake to a to a reservation in order to um, get services. 
So yeah, I mean, it's it's become a real issue I, insofar as using plants and sort of um, botany. Um, I don't know sort of about, about that aspect of it. One of our one of our tribal elders passed away. Um, it's been a while now. Um, and she was sort of the preeminent person that people would go to. But yeah, a lot of those people were around her. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know about using that as an entry point, but that is an issue here with with um, these people claiming Chumash. And now I've got I know at least five people who are doing it within our our Kumiai community um, that I know of that I know of. So yeah, um, I think there's also something to be said just in, in terms of who these people are who are doing this. <clears throat> I think you know my story was about kind of an extreme. Um, this man clearly has has, you know, is 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 ill, um, but I, I do think you know we're not supposed to diagnose from afar. But narcissistic personality disorder seems to be a constant through a lot of these people and what they do. Um, I, again, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I have no background in this, but it seems pretty consistent with that or comorbid with other sorts of, of personality disorders. But I think the bulk of the people who, who do this are just cynical people, you know? It's not that extreme. The Ward Churchills, the Tim Barrises, there was somebody who was outed a month or so ago from New York, you know, a activist, uh, agitator, blah, blah, blah. It all, you know, that, that it all seems very consistent with, with, um, with certain personality disorders. But I think most of the time, these people are just, they're just cynical. You know, they, they, they want something. They view, they view culture, Indian cultures, for all their bluster and all their sort of, we are native, we respect, blah, blah, blah. They view it as a very, in a very Western way that this is something I can take. This belongs to me. You know, that's where they're coming from. This is a commodity that I can take. It belongs to me. And Indian people don't think like that. I am not who I am because I decided to be or because it belongs to me. I am because those people told me I am. People who are, who are responsible for me being here. And most Indian people think that way. But, um, but these people, it's just, you know, they really regard it in a very Western way. And I think it's really ironic because they're out there with their fists in the air and, you know, and land back and blah, 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 blah. But they're, they're very Western and they're thinking that this is a something that belongs to me, my possession. Yeah, I see. Um, um, I, I saw a comment by, um, we should promote the understanding that university's investment in self-ID as the determinant of indigenous identity is a veiled, though fundamental attack on tribal sovereignty. And I think this is absolutely true. I think it's, um, so, you know, with a lot of these, especially these state universities, right, that are on land grant, they're on our land that was taken from us, right? Um, the very existence of states themselves as entities were only is only possible once they actually uh, sort of conquered us and took our land. You know, if you look at the uh, sort of the um, how the uh, the system was set up with the Northwest Territories, you know how to how how you become go from a territory to a state. You have to have so many white men there who can vote. Uh, all this stuff, right? It is all the creation of states themselves is incumbent on. The destru our, our destruction, right, and 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 um, and um, ir irrelevance, right. So, is it really surprising that these institutions would do the same thing, right? These institutions have never had to comprehend our existence, and uh, you know, I think, um, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, I would say that it, it's not surprising they don't understand sovereignty, right, or they don't want to deal with it in, a, in, a, in an, off, an honest way. You're looking at Michigan State, where um, George was talking about on the first panel, the opening panel about how their goals in starting the Native American Studies Department, right, was to in order to begin to sort of really emphasize the need for uh, nation to nation negotiations for tribes in Michigan, right? Tribal nations in Michigan with the state, with the federal government, with these other agencies and entities, you know, in order to really begin to work on those relationships to build and to protect their communities and native communities our reservation communities are some of the most vulnerable. They are by, by they, no, no, they are the most vulnerable communities in the country, bar none. But if by any statistical measure that we are the poorest, we are, you know, in, in every way, 
right? And a lot of these issues like MIW, like the issue of jurisdictional gaps in the law that make us more vulnerable on our own lands, right? To assault and sexual rape and everything that makes it possible is only because we are federally enrolled, right? If you're not federally enrolled, none of this applies to you, none of it, right? There's no a jurisdictional gap for you. It does not exist, you know? And so there's all these ways in which the structure is set up in a way that makes us more vulnerable. And this is what the Native American Studies Departments were set up to address by our elders in the 70s and 80s, do you know I mean? And the minute they get it set up and they get all the money going, who comes in? Who comes in to take it, right? And, and to put themselves there. And then to rename it indigenous studies in order to make us marginalize us further from these, these things that we set up ourselves to try to help ourselves. Right. You know, it's it, it is there is an act of aggression in it that is that is real and, and it can be and it's measurable, right? So it's um it, it's uh yeah, and someone else asked me a question about um uh, these sort of self-identified people going and working in elementary schools and secondary schools. I'm not so familiar with that so much. I, I have to say, I, I, I guess maybe I, I might want to take a look into that more and see what's going on there exactly. I mostly have heard about it and seen it in the um, in uh, university and college um, sort of thing. And then of course um, in the arts as well and in, in publishing particularly. Uh, and, um, and so it's, um, yeah. So that's that's why we were looking at amending the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, you know, which is not very well enforced as it is, right? But amending it to include authorship and performing arts as well. Uh, so that would be a way of you know beginning to sort of put some, you know, to <laughs> it doesn't stop everything. I think someone was asking me about uh, Merritt Johnson, who I recently. Uh, Instagrammed about, and I did a podcast about her as well. She's a woman who was claiming a white woman who was claiming Mohawk descent. You know, once again, this sort of very vague sort of claim. And um, and so someone contacted me was like, well, I think she's a fake. And I was like, whoa. And because I mean, my mother-in-law is a Mohawk Johnson. She's um, from a descendant of um, uh, you know of the of the Johnson family there on Six Nations. And um, and uh, and so. It's just uh, her grandfather, her father, Melvin Johnson, and her uncle, Harold Johnson, were both the Mohawk Bear Clan chiefs there at Six Nations. And so I looked into it, and what we found was that, yeah, she's totally white. I mean, her family tree is completely white. I mean, literally one quarter of it is pilgrim, like literal pilgrim, right? Like one quarter of her tree. And then the other part, her the other half is English Jamaican, which her family owned massive Jamaican slave, they had slave plantations, plus they had a huge estate. Her great grandfather was born to this huge estate in England as well, you know. And then they went over and they helped overthrow the Hawaiian government, the Hawaiian sovereignty, you know. The, I mean, they, these are colonists. And then the most, um, probably the least um, culpable member part of her family is the Johansson part. She's, the Johnson is actually Swedish. Her ancestors came over in the 1890s to Walla Walla, Washington and, and got Indian land and started farming, you know? And so it's, um, it's a totally colonial tree, yet she's trying to pass it off as somehow, um, you know, she's even trying to kind of claim that she's part black and from Jamaica, you know, even though her ancestors, you know, own these mass, I mean, they were also magistrates over Jamaica. So they oversaw the administration of a slave state, you know, and uh, it's just, these people have, also I'm saying, we do think that there is an issue of narcissism here, that they are on the spectrum of narcissism. This is, um, it's almost, it's completely crazy. And, uh, and the sad thing is when, you know, people are brought into that, um, that sphere, you know, um, I really do compare this to, uh, you know, this whole sort of idea of the, um, the con artist and, and how they work on people and, um, and, and build those very strong ties with people, you know, even marrying into our tribes, into our families and, um, and very, a lot of confusion and, and dividing families. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people who have had pretend Indians marry into their families and just how much pain it causes the families. I mean, and, uh, and, and when, you know, some people call them out and then they are disowned, you know, it's, it's just more suffering that we don't really need uh, on top of everything else we do. Do we need this? No, we do not need this. So you want to try the, uh, uh, there's one by uh, Sikwis, I think the name is. Um, there are those that are reconnecting who have Native ancestors way, way back. You've kind of spoken to this a bit. However, they're essentially white at this point, grew up white and privileged. 
Uh, they, then they use that fraction of Indian bud when it's convenient for them to create social media platform, get funds, et cetera. Yeah, when I started the list, uh, studying the list uh, January of last year, I really thought that the issue would be that people were just a very dis distant ancestry, right? That they were the ones who were, um, but no, what I found was that most of these people have no native ancestry. They're just using that as a cover. And um, so most of the people you meet claiming descent, I would say are probably lying, right? That I can, you know, we'll get all the data out there and everything, but it's most likely they're not telling the truth, right? And, uh, but, uh, but in the case of descent, you know, uh, you know, I think uh, that is another conversation. Um, every tribe has different rules um, of how they how they regard some whether someone can be a citizen or not. Uh, I think uh, that is kind of a different conversation entirely from outright fraud. I wouldn't put it in the same thing. I, I think it is. Um, I, I guess I just brought it up because in the sense that these people are making claims that are so distant. Some of them, uh, you know, and I look at my own family and. Uh, you know, my dad was five eighths Dakota, and so he was three eighths European, and I'm three sixteenths. Yeah, three sixteenths, and um, and so you know, I do have European ancestry, but um, my last name is Keeler, so that's a German name, Kehler. But I'm only one thirty second German. You know, I really don't know if I could pull off an entire German identity. Do you know I mean? Um, you know, I have, you know, traditional Navajo grandparents that didn't speak English. Am I supposed to ignore them and just be German? I mean, it's, it's just, this is what they're doing. You know, it doesn't even make any sense. And, um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's probably, I mean, there, there is, you know, it is, I mean, I, with my own family, I think my cousins, um, you know, as people get farther away, one of the things that they have is that what I see with my cousins on my dad's side that look white or that are now, I guess they're five sixteenths Indian, right? Um, they uh, they don't try to overstep. Uh, they are very respectful of what they don't know, right? And um, I, I don't ever I don't see any of them out there out trying to out Indian everybody. Um, that would never go well on the reservation either. But they are uh, they don't try to do all that stuff, and they're tribally enrolled. You know, my grandfather, our grandfather was beaten to death by the police in Yankton, South Dakota for being a, a Dakota man. He was three quarters Dakota, you know? I mean, they, they, they have all the same, those experiences as well in sort of the epigenetic sense um, and that, 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 that trauma that we all carry. They have that, but they don't go around, you know, monetizing it or trying to speak on behalf of our tribe. Uh, they don't do that. And, and they, they would never, presume to do that you know they have they're just kind of aware of what they know what they don't know and what they're right what whether or not they have the right to do that they don't feel they have the right to do that um and, and that's i think that's why you're seeing the level why this is a form of narcissism we keep saying that and i would love to have someone who <laughs> we're going to try to get um get more of a psychological review of it but it's just the fact that someone could do that you know uh is pretty i mean that that says a lot that's a big giveaway i think so. so I think this next one, you both might be able to speak to um, the Raven Sinclair question is, what is your experience of pretendians who co-opt indigenous supporters, defendians who believe their lies? I've seen pretendians and their defendian take groups and organizations to their knees because of the factions created amongst indigenous colleagues. It baffles me. I don't know if there's a level of, of hell for people who turn their Indians who turn their backs on other Indians. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are the ones keeping it afloat. If we all went, if, if all, every Indian person took a stand, it would be done. But these people are allowing it to, to continue. I don't know, Jackie, you know, Jackie has spoken to this really eloquently. It's sort of the psychology or the, the financial um, motivations why Indian people will protect these people. I, I think a lot of it is shame. I think they feel, I think they're embarrassed. I'm, I still feel embarrassed when I, I, I think of, you know, my interactions with these people with this, this incident that I told you about. It's like, oh God, how could I have been so stupid? It's embarrassing. And so I think a lot of these people are staving it off. They know, they know that something is amiss, but it's just too, there's a lot of humiliation involved in telling the world, I got duped, man, I got duped. 
you know, um, and I think that uh, a lot of people are again are are, are staving this are, are staving this up. But I think Jackie Jackie has spoken this really eloquently in terms of the power um, that uh, the, the the kind of power dynamics between these two groups. Yeah, I think I've described it as a power sharing. You know, uh, I think that um, that well, I I've I've tweeted this out and on put on Facebook posts and stuff. But I think there are three main reasons why someone would be a defendant. The first one is that they're in on the fraud. You know, they are themselves a crook as well, right? Uh, the second reason is that they have been they have been utterly taken in by the fraud, like that they're they're gullible, basically. You know, the third reason is is that and this is a bit more complicated, um, is that they have holes in their, their sense, their identity, right? That leave them vulnerable to being manipulated by white con artists, right? And um, which is not a good thing, I mean? It's an understandable thing considering everything we've all been through, right? But it's not a good thing, especially if someone is a leader because that means that white people can do that to them in other ways too, you know? And I think that, um, so I think that like I said, many of these, these things are litmus tests, like who are you? What kind of, what kind of leader are you? If, if you're a leader, right? What kind, what, what, is, what is going on there? And, and we have so few ways of understanding each other because we, we are all so far apart from one another in, in the Indian community. Um, but this is one way you can tell, you know, what's going on there. And um, so, you know, and, I, and there are many ways in which a person's identity can be vulnerable to this kind of manipulation, right? Um, you know, maybe they have very low blood quantum, right? And they're, they're nervous about that. They don't feel good about it. Um, you know, they maybe they've been raised more with their white family and they are not acculturated. And so they feel more comfortable with perform people who are performing the identity, right? Um, maybe, they, maybe they're resentful of full bloods and how they make them feel. Do you know what I mean? Who knows? I mean, those are all speculative. I'm not saying that it applies to anybody, but I mean, there, this is what I mean by ways in which people's identity sort of has holes in it, right? And, and which that, you know, which that uh, con artist can reach in and sort of mess with them, you know? And, uh, and I think that is what's going on um, mostly. I don't know, I, and, uh, I mean, there might be people who feel embarrassed, but. I, I can't imagine that that embarrassment would last so long as some of these folks have been going on and on, refusing to look at the information provided, refusing. I mean, some of these frauds are just completely obvious. Like, I mean, I wish I could have shown you the family trees, which I will put up, um, but they're literally, like literally there's no way they can be Indian, right? There's literally no way. And, and, and so, and, and if it was so far back in the 1600s, what does it even mean at this point, right? You know. Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, it, it's just uh, completely, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, defendianism is, is, is something that uh, I guess I didn't really expect. I thought that once we put the list out and we show the extent um, and the pervasiveness of fraud, right, um, that people would act, people would, would be like, this is, oh my God, we should do something about this. I didn't expect people, particularly PhDs, right, to sit there and go, we don't want to look, how dare you look? I mean, it's completely bizarre behavior. It is absolutely bizarre, particularly since their job is to do research. You know, they have a doctorate, they presented a thesis, they defended it, surely they know how to do research, right? <laughs> but no, 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 they, they don't want to do research on this, on this issue, right? And, um, and a lot of the, you know, it's just, it's quite astounding. I, I don't know, it's, um, but I mean, human beings, you know, we are, um, we are not strictly logical creatures. And, uh, and I think the QAnon movement has shown just how vulnerable people are to being manipulated uh, online, particularly. And, uh, and so uh, I think though, a lot of the, um, the online stuff though, is we don't really know who are behind a lot of these accounts either, you know? Uh, anybody can say, as, as Cedar was saying, they can put on any sort of identity um, online. And, and we've seen uh, that happen, uh, that uh, one lady, she was hold, she had that fake Twitter account that it was actually um, a fake Hopi archaeologist account on Twitter. You know, it's, um, you know, that kind of fraud exists. And we don't know how many sort of white sock puppet uh, accounts there are out there. So. And I, somebody somebody asked about <clears throat> what advice do you have for a tribal member who is concerned 
with a young female pretendian who was embedding herself in our tribe's language department. I'm working on sending emails to my leaders to let them know I'm not okay with her teaching our language or claiming to know of our voice. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's putting it back on the tribe, but I assume that you can go to a tribal meeting, you can be, be part of the general council meeting and bring this up and that this person probably will not be able to attend, right? I mean, I know in our community, non-tribal non, non members are not allowed. They have to get special permission. Um, but I think the way you're doing it is, is the way it should be. The tribe has to speak for itself. Um, and you know, do, your, do your, your due diligence insofar as finding out who she is, who this person is. But yeah, it's, it's I mean, can you imagine if, if, <laughs> if tribal nations were given the respect that they are due and that they, if they had this, this, um, this authority to step out and to, to right these wrongs, I mean, there would be a lot less of it. These people do it because they think they can get away with it. Um, and you get you know, away with it. <laughs> they do get away with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, their, their, you know, their pushback is, is growing, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I just, I, I see, I see the tribal nations as being sort of central centered to to how we're going to combat this and them having a kind of moral and legal authority to do that. So I think if a person is going to the tribe, that's where you that's where you go. Yeah. Well, the um, what, what can tribes do about this? I mean, I think uh, well, part of what I do when I check I mean, very few of the frauds that we investigate claim that they are enrolled. So it is usually not necessary for me to call the tribe to check enrollment because they already say they're not enrolled, right? So they're just claiming descent. Um, so all we have to do is ascertain who their parents are and who their grandparents are. Once you get to the grandparent level, you have people who are deceased, in which case almost all the documentation on their life is now public, publicly available. And, um, and once you get to the generation that's before uh, the 1940 U.S. Census, then you have a lot of information about families. The U.S. Census data, the, the information provided in the U.S. Census is like a fingerprint for a family, right, or a, a thumbprint. You know, it's like, it's always, like, how many families have names in those orders with those ages attached? Do you know what I mean, living in this location? There's only one family. And, um, and so it's really easy to trace a family back and to see, you know, where, who they are, where they lived, where they married. You know, there's just so much information out there. And um, I think we would love, I mean, we should do like a genealogical teaching thing because with, uh, with so much, you know, people like are really um, upset that we, you know, that so I was using ancestry.com, but, you know, ancestry.com has a lot of, a lot of things on it uh, you could access to, uh, including not only the U.S. Census, but also uh, they have the Indian Census. Right, and uh, one of the things that uh, pretendians have really pushed is this idea that, th that these things don't matter. That, uh, uh, but you know what happens is that there is, even if their families aren't on an Indian census, um, their immediate family, I should say, the rest of the family would be. Right, I mentioned that earlier. The, all the other family members would be. You know, if they ever lived in an Indian community, right, you, you you can see all this who they're living next door to. Right, and. Um, and so it's, um, but you also get so much information. I mean, uh, and, and with the Indian census for a lot of tribes, it was yearly, it wasn't every 10 years. So, you know, like with my dad's tribe, the Yank, you know, the Yankton Sioux tribe, you know, there's an Indian census every single year, right? And so you get to see who people, who's living with who, you can see kind of like, if you can't find a death record, you can kind of figure out when they died based on year to year censuses, you know, or if someone got divorced or whatever, there's so much information you can, you know, you can get out of these things, right? And, um, uh, and if someone does not have any Indian censuses in their family at all, that's a sure sign that they are not Indian. You know, their family is not only just identifying as white on the 10 year census, but they have no documentation showing that any member of their, you know, 3000 person tree has ever identified as Indian is a big glue that they're not Indian. Do you know what I mean? And um, and so it's uh, it's it's it is actually. I mean, the amount of information out there is just far more than people realize. And uh, and being having access to it the way we have access to it now did not exist before. And um, and so these frauds, you know, we can check their claims much more easily. I mean, you can literally pretty much figured out pretty fast if this per this is an Indian family or not. There's a huge difference in the documentation and it's real. And I think Trevino also mentioned that, you know, if a person has not been, you don't really need, we, we go way back. We go back to 
you know, when they stepped off the boat in 1620, right? But I mean, we, we trace them back to Europe. We always try to end each line until the family ends up in Europe, right? And, uh, but, uh, but we, um, you know, you know, you really, I don't know that's really necessary. I mean, if your family has not been part of any community, you know, in the last 150 years, I don't know, you know, it's sort of like, you know, there's so much happened in the 150 years that defines us who we are, you know, and if you've been passing as white the whole time, what does that mean? You know, you weren't subjected to Jim Crow, you weren't subjected to any of these laws that oppressed us, you know, you weren't being beaten to death by the police for being Indian, none of that happened to you, you know, and uh, you, you were, you were unmolested, right? You didn't have your cattle and sheep taken away and shot because, you know, because the government said they got to do this. You know, they didn't do that to the white sheep herders. They just did it to the Navajo sheep herders, you know, and, um, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's a really traumatic thing that happened. I mean, some people don't really realize that. I mean, my grandparents would talk about it, they'd start crying, you know, and um, it was, you know, the violence in which we, we are treated and our issues are not, have no concern. That does not happen if you were a white identifying family. Family. I mean, you know, my dad's hometown, um, my grandmother's village on the Missouri River was put underwater by a dam, right? White Swan, doesn't, it's underwater, right? And, um, and that didn't happen to the white towns, right? They, they put those dams on Indian land up and down the Missouri River um, because they didn't want to piss off the white farmers, but they had no problem inundating our farm, best farmland at all, right? There's all kinds of ways in which if you are identifying as Indian and like since 1830, you are being treated in a very different way and your family's had a very different experience. And for people to swoop in now and say, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, not have experienced any of that. You know, I even was doing the tree recently of a woman who's claiming that her family went to boarding school. I think Erica Worth or whatever, totally white family. No, 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 no Indian at all. And you know, it's just it's astounding that they're claiming issues that are really horrible and meaningful and happened to us, but they want to own them themselves and they want to be our spokespeople and make money on doing it as well. So I want to pull something just quickly from the chat, if it's okay. Um, uh, my, uh, my, my colleague Salah makes a good point. If somebody who claims Native ancestry was committed to Indigenous rights, they would now look into their own identities, especially if they have privileges by claiming Nativeness. They should want to know if they are part of the fraud or are they just perpetrating it. And that's a really good point, but I, I, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you speak to I don't understand. So they began their activist careers without this knowledge. I think that's kind of what he's saying. They 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 spout they spout an activist line in certain contexts, like universities, for example. And so at they the entered, same time, yeah. they, they entered a space without and claimed native claim to be Indian without actually knowing this. Is that it? I mean, is that is that what they're doing? And then I, I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the point is that they're not doing that. That that they're not doing what he's saying they would be if they were real activists. They're they're claiming to be activists, but at the same time they're pretendings. And and so, you know, this is just another part of the puzzle that they can create a narrative that makes it seem like they're they're activists, but they're pretendings. And so. Right. Yeah, that that's operates counter to everything they're saying. Right. So, sorry, go ahead. Um, it's pretty garden was, variety, isn't it? <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like what I was saying, where like, you know, my cousins, um, I don't mean to bring them into this, but you know, some of them, um, some of my dad's nieces and nephews look white and they're um they're five sixteenths Indian, which is just a sixteenth over a quarter, right? Um, so they're enrolled in the Yankton Sioux tribe, right? And uh, but they would never presume to, to be a spokesperson uh, for the tribe. Um, I mentioned my cousin, Larry Plank, he, um, he's, he just recently passed away, but he was an attorney and uh, you know, he interned at NARF and everything, but he, uh, he ran the uh, Legal Aid Center in Rapid City, South Dakota for 20 years. Uh, he's my oldest cousin. And he, um, and, you know, I, he never, uh, I was reviewing a lot of his cases that he, he handled over those years. And a lot of it was fighting for na Native families to keep their kids. Do you know I mean? He served on an ICWA committee in the state of South Dakota. You know, he did literally hundreds, probably several hundred cases fighting for Native families, Native parents to keep their, their kids. And, and, you know, he never, ever 
round and round promoting himself as Mr. Super Indian. He's an enrolled tribal member. Both of his, you know, his grandparents were Indian, you know, and everything. And he did real meaningful work for Native families, concrete work for 20 years, right? Never put, never, you know, it's just like, why is that even necessary to, to market yourself? As Indian, it's it's not necessary to do the work, even if you are Indian. You know what I mean, it, it's just so crazy. And if you don't know if you're actually Indian in any way, I mean, it, it's like why do it? I don't understand. You know, uh, I mean, and, and and people who who have been told false stories by their parents, right? People, second generation pretendians. We we have them. They're real. You know. You know, if I woke up one day and found out my parents had lied to you about being Native, I would not at all, like, hang on to it and try to keep it. I mean, I would be, you know, I don't even know how that would work. That is such a mind trip, right? And uh, it's just but that we see that all the time, people who are second generation Indian people who are pretendians, you know, I mean, I went to call, I went to Dartmouth College with some of them, do you know what I mean? And, uh, and you know, and I, I, it was hard, I put one of them on the list, you know, she was my friend at one point. And now she's not my friend anymore, obviously. But you know, her family has no has none of the ancestry she claims, right? And or her father claimed, and um, and so uh, you know, she was an actress, so she took roles from Native women, right? Native, and uh, her father's an artist, and you know, he was actually raided by the feds for violating the Indian Arts and Crafts Act, you know, and uh, so I mean. You know, but you know, we did a retreat. There is no no connection to these tribes, and and you know, she has a very interesting history, and I think it's a very, I, I think that her family really, you know, there you know, there's actually been a lot of these pretendians. There's been books written about their families. Like it's not even like the heart. I mean, especially if you're a PhD and you haven't read the book written about your family, or there's like in a whole, you know, like with um. Nita Lucchesi, there's a whole fort and with a whole museum and a, a history director. There's a, I mean, it's completely ridiculous. These people don't know. I mean, there is a level of, I think, um, of, uh, of opportunistic, opportunism, right? I think it's, uh, you know, um, one of these frauds, um, his own brother wrote a letter to the university. He's at uh, KU, right? His own brother wrote a letter because on her dying bed, his, his mother demanded that her mother, his grandmother be recognized as her, the full um, proud Polish woman she was. He was passing her off as 100% Comanche. And the brother wrote a letter to the university saying, you know, uh, he, my brother was, you know, sick of being passed over for faculty appointments. So he decided he would play the affirmative action game, right? This is from the letter written by his brother. And so, but our grandmother was 100% Polish, right? And he found a black and white photo of her and he thought that she might, this photo might pass for being Indian. And he chose the Comanche nation because he thought they kept bad records. And even after receiving this, which was signed by many of his cousins, one of them, a sitting judge, another one um, who serves in the state legislature in California, they put their names and their addresses and their phone numbers, like 20 relatives sent this to the university and the university still ignored it. Yeah, he's still working there. So it's, and the fraud is like, it seems resistant to actual information. Like universities are supposed to be, be about research. They are completely refusing to do research on this matter and supporting outright fraud. Did I answer the question? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think so. Um, so there's a few more in the chat. Can you see them? Uh, for instance, the one from Jean Kent, I believe it is. Some people. Uh, can you just read one of them or? Maybe just take a look at it, Jacqueline. It's the second from the bottom. If you're at the very bottom, just look up one from the bottom yeah. and uh, take a look at it. Can I say something to this, this Gene Kent? Aren't you concerned that building a list of fake Indians set yourself up as judge capable of making an error? Nobody has said, A, Gene Kent, this is Indian country's list. This is Indian country's list. Jackie did not make this list. The collective made this list, okay? And the list is self-correcting. If somebody doesn't deserve it to be on it, they're not on it, okay? What kind of lateral violence does that create for individuals who are deemed native by law? They're not on the list. They're not on the list, okay? Um, and what point on, at what point on reservations do people with a W 
on their birth certificate cease to be native. That's an issue of the tribe. I don't know, whatever, every tribe has its own standards, but if they have family there, if they have <clears throat> aunts and uncles and everything, it's, it's a non-issue. They're part of that community. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is about community. People talk about this list and all they can think of are my individual rights and not the collective. They never think about the collective, about what harm this does to Indian country and in mass. It's always about, well, what about that person's rights? It's a very Western way of thinking about it. Anyway, I was reading that and it, it upset me. So yeah, I didn't see it, but I think the, um, so first of all, you know, uh, we've worked, gone through the 200, and these were people whose names were given to me and also who have already been outed, many of them, you know, completely outed, like like that lawsuit of the Cheyenne Nation, right? And, um, and, and these are, you know, a number of folks I'd heard of in the past. And, and, uh, and, and there are people on the list who have been verified. You know, right. We have verified people on the list. And, uh, and this allows them a chance, you know, uh, to, to, to answer, the, because these are answer people who've been questioning them. When we verify someone, that means that we've proven that what they've said is true, right? So if they've been verified, this goes in their favor, right? We have um, a couple of different ways of, 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 we don't just do yes or no, we have um, A, B, C, and D, right? A is where we have verified it. B is where it's unverifiable due to, uh, you know, um, adoption. C is just, we have not, we can't verify it, right? And then D is unver where we've actually proven the opposite, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, there, uh, you know, I, I think if anybody, I, if someone wanted to check to see if I'm Native, Ah, it wouldn't be a problem, Jamie, because because my family tree shows clearly that I am native, right? In addition to my enrollment, right? And I mean, if that one person has a W on one census record, we don't look at one record. We look at a lot of records around a person's life, particularly, you know, and also we look at their family, their extended family, you know. I mean, you know, even if their direct line family has is, is not recorded because for whatever reason, the rest of the family would be recorded at some point, even if you have to go nine generations back, someone is going to be recorded as being Indian, right? In that family, you know, and, and so, but if what, you keep building the tree out, right? And all you find are more white people, this is a white family. That is not lateral violence. And, and you know, the people on the list, they are all people who have monetized the claim. These are not private people. Right? These are not people who are just telling someone privately or reconnecting privately. These are people who have made their careers on being Indian, on these claims, and who would not have careers without these claims. Right. So this is not, this isn't, this is a, this is not, these are not private people, right? This is not your uncle in the backyard, your white uncle who says, oh, I think I'm part Indian while he's doing the barbecue. No, no, this is not the case. Or this is not even someone privately reconnecting. Right, these are people who have monetized it, put a dollar sign on it, and they're taken in money. They're speaking for us. They're you know like speaking for us in very official capacities, whether at the UN or you know to the media or you know to Congress. They are speaking for us, right? And so there has to be a higher standard if they are doing these things, right? So these are um, so you know, if these people do not want to have to confirm what they're claiming and to be paid to do it, they should simply never have done it, right? You know, like my cousin Larry. I mean, he never sat around all the time. I'm Yankton. I'm Yankton. Even though he was a tribal member, even though he was doing work for Indian people, it's completely unnecessary to do that. But if you are doing it, then what the heck is wrong with actually verifying it? We verify everything we put into, you know, when I send an article out to an editor, every, they said they sent it to a fact checker, right? And that comes back and the fact checker wants to know, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? If they cannot verify that that's true, it's taken out of the article. You know, I had this really great quote once from Benjamin Franklin and we were unable to verify it. This was for a piece I did for uh, the Nation magazine. You know, we looked and, and you know, and it was that um, I, the statement was that uh, that um, that Benjamin Franklin spoke Mohawk, right? Because they translate the translations that he did for the the uh, for Pennsylvania on the treaties, which a lot of Iroquois people would speak, leader traditional leaders would speak up, you know, and, and they would publish them and stuff, and they were bestsellers for him. And uh, and I said that he spoke Mohawk, and they could not verify that that he spoke Mohawk. 
So they took that out of the article, you know, and, and I was sad, you know, I was like, darn it, you know, and, but I mean, verification of stated facts, it's just normal. It's not even, and if people are afraid of verification, well, what the heck, why, what, I don't even understand, why are they monetizing it then? To me, to a lot of these people, it's a commodity. This is about being a commodity. This is not, this is not, this is not about being an actual, like actually being native, right? Which is not a commodity. We are not commodities, but to them, it is a commodity. And what they're fighting for, just like Trevino said, is they, if you challenge their right to monetize it, they will come after you with everything they got. And, and this is the actual fight here, is the monetization and commodification of our identity and the exclusion and marginalization, marginalization of Native people who refuse to go along with it. Right on. <laughs> there are numerous others in the chat still. Oh, How are you yeah. going? Anything you want to want to go for here? Anything that stands out to you? Well, I, <clears throat> Tiffany was asking about the Navajo Nation having any concern or opposition to Roan Horses appropriation and selling out of their culture and stories. Do you know when have there has there been any pushback at a governmental level or a cultural level? Yeah, it was um, um there was a Navajo writers group called Saba Hajo which did a letter um, protesting or, you know, addressing uh, the, um, well, with, with Rebecca Roanhorse Parish, I first met her on Twitter and I was a big supporter of hers. I had no idea. I thought she was Navajo. I mean, I know Roan Horses from the Navajo Nation. I just, you know, took it at face value. I didn't check anything. And, um, and in 2018, I went to go speak uh, as, a, as a keynote speaker at a conference on the Navajo Nation. And, uh, and when I got there, there was a whole bunch of Navajo writers and professors, and they wanted me to join them in a meeting they were having, and it was to discuss her book, Trail of Lightning. And I was mindlessly, she would tag me in tweets, and I would just retweet them, yay, buy her book, kind of thing, you know. And, um, and I was really embarrassed, because I had been retweeting and promoting this book, and I'd never read it, you know. And they were really upset, and, um, and they started telling me it was in the book. And, I was, and I've done a whole podcast on, on Rebecca Roanhorse. You can see that at Pollination on Facebook. And, um, and I was like, oh, my God, I had no idea. And I go into why culturally these things that, that were in the book are really offensive to in Navajo culture. And, uh, and so they worked, you know, I, I, as a journalist, I was uneasy about write, signing a letter about this because, you know, um, they're mostly poets and those kinds of writers. So it, it's different for them, you know? And um, so I, I, but they kept me in their email chain for the next year, they worked on that letter. And they worked very carefully, trying to make sure it was fair, make sure it was all these things, you know? And then they published it uh, in June of 2019, Indian Country Day. And, uh, and, the, and this also happened to a Pueblo writer, um, uh, Debbie Reese, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Illinois, who, uh, who actually did try to reconnect uh, Rebecca with her people. I think she's, she, her, her mother or someone is from that Pueblo as well. Okay, Wenge, that she was claiming. And, uh, and, and based on the concerns brought forward by the Navajo writers, Debbie had written a, a critical blog piece on her blog, American Indian Children's Literature. And I, I'd known Debbie for a number of years. I'd published her. I was an editor at the Good Man Project, and I had published some of her stuff. And she did some really great pieces. She's um, she's really she uses her platform to advocate for more diverse books, more more, um, more diverse authors and in, in young adults publishing. Um, and um, and so she had a platform, right? And you know, she's an elderly woman. She's you know, and she's a grandmother. And um, and, and she basically wrote this piece saying, you know, bringing out the concerns about the misappropriation of culture in the book. Uh, you know, she, you know, and so it was, um, and she got attacked. She was the first one to be hit with these anti-Blackness allegations, right? And, uh, and it was horrible. She was just so devastated. Uh, I spoke to her a year later in a phone conversation with her and, and me and Joy Harjo, who the National Poet Laureate and Muskogee uh, writer, poet, and, and her voice was still shaking. Like she was so traumatized by that, by what they did. And you know, she had tried really hard to advocate, to bring, to try to reconnect uh, Rebecca to her alleged Pueblo, right? 
she spent two years trying to help her do that. Uh, but because she wrote a critical blog about her misuse of Navajo culture, um, she was basically canceled on, um, you know, and, and labeled anti-Black. And, and it was, and, um, and then that happened again to the Navajo writers who signed that letter. Um, a number of them lost, uh, lost uh, they were, had um, speaking engagements canceled and they, they decided to back away. I think wisely, because basically what they try to do is cancel in the entire generation of Navajo literature so that she could continue to hold that space and monetize it, right? And, and so, yeah, Navajos have tried to address this issue, and, um, but they paid a huge price for doing it. And that's the price we all pay, you know? I mean, I, I said earlier, like, we don't know how much we lost in all this because, you know, I worked on an article in 2018 uh, for Palacio Magazine, which is the magazine for New Mexico uh, State, New Mexico State Museums. And the editors there asked me to write an article about ethnic fraud in the art world. And I, I interviewed uh, a Ojibwe uh, artist, um, uh, David Bradley. And um, I had to actually interview him over email because he has MS, right? And, uh, and, and he, and everyone, everyone I interviewed, all the different, you know, art people um, and native art people, they were telling me, well, you gotta talk to him. You gotta talk to him. You know, he did, he has done these amazing pieces about uh, sort of the land, land of fakes. He took the um, Land of Lakes Butter Lady and turned it into a kind of a pretendian art thing. <laughs> and, um, and so, and he was challenging one of these fakes, particularly Jimmy Durham, the late Jimmy Durham. And so I, I and he told me, yeah, everyone, his career is not what it could have been because he challenged these frauds in the art world. And, and he paid the price with his career. And, you know, there are so much that we have lost in this. You know, there's, there's books that weren't written. There's art that we don't have. There are, you know, intellectual discourses that we have not been able to hold. You know, we have not been able to do so many things because these fakes sit there and they, they basically push us out if we try to question them. And, and so, we have to question them. You know, this whole thing of like, you can't have a list, you can't have that. It really reminds me of the sort of um, where you, where a violent, um, when you're in a violent relationship, they try to isolate you. So you think you're the only one or you, you, you don't have rights to do anything except what they can tell you can do. And, and it feels very much like that. We're, I mean, the settler colonial relationship is a violent relationship, generally speaking. But in this case, it is particularly violent, and um, and and so it's uh, it, it is not they're it's not they're not trying to flatter us by trying to be us, you know. It, it's something else is going on here, and it's not good. So. so we're coming kind of to the the end of things, I think, um, are, you, are you both good with where we are? Do you wanna make some final closing remarks? Um, uh, and then, then we'll call it a night. Uh, I want everyone to remember that there's another session tomorrow night, same time. Um, we have two really great speakers then, I think Tawny and America Meredith are speaking then. So please join us again if you, if you have time. Um, but do you wanna close up with some remarks? I'd prefer that from my point of view. <laughs> Yeah. I think I've just said a lot. I want to hear from Cedar. <laughs> no, I just, I, I, I really am um, <clears throat> humbled and, and honored that you all are here. And um, it means a lot to me. Thank you for, for hearing my story. And um, thank you for, for, for fighting the good fight. You wouldn't be here if, if it didn't mean something to you. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, it's time for all of us to tell our stories um, about this. And, uh, and yeah, thank you. And I'll, I will um, put together the material I was going to present, and um, I actually will also email it to you, Gordon, and to um, and you know put it up so it's viewable. Uh, and uh, they put a lot of effort putting it together, and I just ended up kind of free winging it. But I hope some of what I said was helpful. And um, but yeah, we will be. Um, we have more articles coming out. Uh, I've been working on some articles, and um, and we've done so much work on the genealogy. It's insane, and and it's actually really, you know. Uh, chain, it actually has really helped me learn a lot about, um, about our history uh, all over the country for different Indian people and, and how, how, how settler colonialism worked in the details, which we often don't look at the actual lives of individuals. And that's been 
actually it's been incredible actually and and um and I, and I, I don't know if I want to thank you, Pretendian, but it, it, I wouldn't have known all this stuff if I hadn't done it, so. Yes, one more thing. Somebody asked where they can access the list. So if you would get that information to us, we're gonna have that, you know, we can send things out to the, uh, the people yep. who sent it as well. So again, Jimmy Gwetch to you both. Um, it's just, uh, I appreciate your strong spirits and the, and the way that you've, uh, You've moved forward in this, and I knew this was going to be a, a, an important event. But uh, you know, just for the voices and the stories that we've heard already, it's it, I'm just so um, so honored to be part of this with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.